Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon you. First and foremost, blessings and thanks to God for His showers of blessings to all of us, for that for that we can gather to this event, particularly during this COVID-19 pandemic situation. Her Excellency, Vice Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada for Research and Community Development, Ibu Dr. Ika Dewi Ana. Excellency Dean of Faculty of Agriculture of Universitas Gajah Mada, Bapak Dr. Jamhari. Excellency Chairman of Iksatar 2021, Bapak Professor Dr. Ilham. Excellency our distinguished invited speakers, guests, presenters, and participants, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to welcome all of you to the first international conference on sustainable agricultural socioeconomics, agribusiness, and rural development, or first Iksatar 2021. This event is held and hosted by the Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. Taking the topic of sustainable agriculture, socioeconomics, agribusiness, and rural development in the era of Industrial Revolution 4.0, the first Iksatar 2021 will gather academia, students, and experts from various institutions worldwide to share their research and knowledge in relation to the topic. Now kindly allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dian Yuanita, a master's student in the Faculty of Agriculture of Universitas Gajah Mada. It is my pleasure to be the master of ceremony for this conference day. And I would like to deliver a brief summary of our agenda today, that we will have a keynote speech and plenary sessions with distinguished invited speakers from five different countries, then followed by the parallel or presentation sessions afterward and this event will be closed with an award ceremony. Also, we would like to inform you that this event will also it in our faculty's YouTube channel. You may check on Media Fawpertas YouTube channel. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to begin this conference, we would like to invite all of you to sing together the national anthem of Indonesia Raya and him, Gajah Mada.
Thank you for your participation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to hear the welcoming remarks from the chairman of the first Excel Start 2021 that will be delivered by Professor Dr. Iham. For whom, Professor Dr. Iham, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, Her Excellency, Vice Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada, Dr. Ika Dewiana, our Dean of Faculty of Agriculture, our Deans of the Faculty of Agro Complex, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'm uh, so delighted to welcome all the distinguished participants at the first international conference on sustainable agricultural socioeconomics, uh, agribusiness, and rural development, uh, ISASAR 2021. Today marks our first international conference, and we are proud to be able to add, uh, to host uh, this conference here at the University of Gajah Mada with all of you. I bid a very warm welcome to all the renowned speakers who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this conference. Indeed, we are honored to have you all with us. Therefore, let me uh, extend my sincere gratitude and appreciations uh, to all the eminent speakers from some parts of the world who join us here to share their knowledge and best experience uh, regarding the various issues of sustainable agricultural economics, uh, agribusiness, and uh, rural development. This is the first conference in the history of our department, which is completely uh, conducted on a digital platform in line with the social distancing norms due to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the, the Department of Agricultural Socioeconomics, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada, organizes this conference to enlighten our minds and promote the participation of researchers and then lecturers, uh, observers, and scholars at all levels. For your information, 
there will be seven sub themes of this conference, which will be discussed in the parallel sessions, namely agricultural management, and then agriculture and rural development, uh, sustainable agriculture and agribusiness, agricultural finance and cooperatives, agro-industry, human resource development in agriculture, and ICT for agricultural development. We are also proud to announce that this conference is being conducted uh, along with the cooperations of the Department of Agricultural and Socioeconomics and the Indonesian Agricultural Economist Associations, or we call it perhaps chapter uh, Yogyakarta. The main outcome of this conference is to come up with the national and international framework in providing a platform to support to support new opportunities and and also uh, future collaborations. Uh, we hope that this one day conference will broaden our horizons of thinking in the face of uh, disruptions in all areas of life. Uh, before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciations to all steering and organizing committee members who generously help us make this event come together to become a success. I guarantee that the conference will be productive and worth your precious time. Thank you. Thank you, Bapak Profesor Dr. Irham, for your remarkable speech. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, next, I'm honored to invite the Vice Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada for Research and Community Development, Ibu Dr. Ika Dewi Anna, to deliver her opening remarks. And on this occasion, we would also request Ibu Dr. Ika Dewi Anna to officially open the first Iqtasar 2021. For whom, Ibu Dr. Ika Dewi Anna, the time is yours, Bu. Uh, thank you very much. Selamat pagi, very good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On behalf of Universitas Gajah Mada, we are pleased to welcome you all to the International Conference on Sustainable Agricultural Socioeconomics, Agribusiness, and Rural Development 2021. On these occasions, we are greatly honored to greet the keynote and invited speakers. Today, we have participants from all over the world. Therefore, we also would like to extend our warm welcome and thank you to all participants. As we know, the era of the Industrial Revolution 4.0 has entered a new chapter with the COVID-19 pandemic situations. In this era, technology has become an inseparable part of all sectors, one of which is the agricultural sector. Agriculture is the mainstay of the sector during the pandemic conditions and a key sector for economic recovery. While the city is an area that requires food supply, rural area is the front line for food production. As a result, rural areas need to be empowered and developed so that they are more familiar with the technology. On the other hand, environmental aspects is a key aspect towards reaching sustainable agriculture. Speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, the activity that can bring together the main scientific actors to deliver a complete inventory of all studies on sustainable agriculture socioeconomics is important. Therefore, this first international conference entitled International Conference on Sustainable Agriculture, Socioeconomics, Agribusiness, and Rural Development is organized by the Department of Agricultural Socioeconomics 
Universitas Gajah Mada. So thank you very much for the department and for all the steering and technical committees of this conference. The main topic in this conference is very crucial for us. In addition, there are several subtopics we can participate that is also very crucial for us in the area of education, research, and community services. We hope that this international conference will be a fruitful forum for sharing knowledge and academic work in agricultural socioeconomics, agribusiness, and rural development, because this is one of the main concern of Universitas Gajah Mada. Thank you for the committee, speakers, and all participants. Have a fruitful forum and enjoy the conference. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ibu Dr. Ikadewi Anna, for your remarkable speech. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will hold a photo session. We would like to invite Professor Dr. Iham, Ibu Dr. Ikadewi Anna, Bapak Dr. Jamhari, and all distinguished guests, also invited speakers, to be able to turn on your camera and we will hold a photo session. Ready? Are we ready? Okay. Allow me to count in three, two, one, cheers. Again, three, two, one, cheers. Once more, three, two, one, cheers. Thank you, thank you, Kenny, for your participation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you can see in the participants list here, we have almost 500 people joining us today. It's very wonderful. And we as the committee are so grateful for your participation this morning. And it is, this is not including with the YouTube streaming. I believe that it's more than 500 people joining us today. And also, I believe that most of us are not patient enough to follow our main agenda, which are the keynote speech and plenary sessions. So now, without further ado, we will begin the keynote speech. This keynote speech will be led by our moderator, by our chairman of the first Iksasat 2021. And allow me to introduce him by reading his CV. His name is Professor Dr. Irham MSc. He is also the director for graduate program of Agribusiness Management, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. He holds his PhD in Environmental and Resource Economics in the University of Tokyo, Japan. His Master of Science in Rural and Regional Planning in Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok. His Bachelor of Science in Agriculture Economics, Faculty of Agriculture, Gajah, Universitas Gajah Mada. He also has conducted a short-term training on the International Executive Development Program in University of New England, University, Australia. He also involved in various as associations and organi organizations. Two of them are the International Society of Organic Farming and Agricultural Research and as associate member of high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition in the Food and Agriculture Organization, or IFAO. He also has conducted more than 120 titles of research, also publications, more than 120 titles also have been published in reputable journals, also publishers. And also he has authored nine books, including self-authored and collaborative books. So please welcome Bapak Professor Dr. Iham. The time is yours, Pak.
Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. MC. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to thank you all for your participation in this conference. Uh, before I start this plenary sessions, uh, let me convey uh, the rules of the game of the sessions. Uh, the first 30 minutes uh, will be a presentation from Professor Sarah Turner, but uh, to avoid connections and other technical problems, we will play the video that she has been prepared uh, before. Uh, after that, uh, there will be a Q&A sessions where Professor Sarah Turner will answer your questions live from Canada. And for your information, time in Canada now is around 10, 9, uh, sorry, 10, 30 p.m. So it's uh, midnight. And the time available for Q&A is approximately 20 minutes. But before the session begins, I will first read her brief uh, curriculum vitae. She is uh, Professor Sarah Turner, Professor in the Department of Geography, McGill University, Montreal, uh, Canada. Uh, her research interest is uh, development geography, and then Southeast Asian geographies, upland minorities in peninsula, Southeast Asia and Southwest China. And then she also interested in research in Hanoi street vendors, vendors and informal sector workers, Eastern Indonesia entrep entrepreneurs, livelihood studies, everyday politics and resistance, commodity change approaches, agrarian change, and last but not least, innovative qualitative methods. Then uh, let us begin with, uh, with playing the video uh, prepared by Professor Sara. Please, uh, the operator. So thank you for this opportunity to uh, deliver a talk today and a special thanks to Prof Erham and the organizers um, for this opportunity. In this talk, I would like to focus on some key ways by which ethnic minority livelihoods are undergoing socio-economic change in the Southeast Asian Massif with a focus on the Sino-Vietnamese borderlands. First, I'm going to introduce the conceptual tools that I draw on for this work including political ecology, livelihood studies, and literature on infrastructural violence. I'll then briefly introduce the context before turning to focus on three vectors of state-driven socioeconomic development. These are hybrid seeds, the creation of national parks, and the construction of permanent marketplaces. I'm going to go on to argue that in this case study, the Viet, while the Vietnamese state is pushing such forms of rural development as win-win opportunities for upland communities, I'm also going to look at how upland minorities continue to contest these state visions and pathways. This work is underpinned by 20 years of yearly field work in the Sino-Vietnamese borderlands until COVID hit, uh, and it includes well over 400 interviews, oral histories, and observations with minority farmers other local residents, state officials, and discussions and collaborations with Vietnamese and Chinese academics. 
Broadly, I'm taking political ecology as a lens through which to look at the environment as an arena where different social actors with asymmetrical power, political power, are competing for access to and control of natural resources. More specifically, I draw on four concepts frequently used by political ecologists. Here I'm interested in examining the access that ethnic minority populations have or lack to natural resources and livelihood options due to state policies and processes, the asymmetrical power relations that are at play and how this is revealed in ethnic minority livelihood decision making. I also draw on the concept of territorialization to focus on the state's appropriation of territory to control and bound space and frequently the resources and people within it. And with this concept, I'm arguing that this could take several forms, such as legal, economic, or symbolic. I also use the concept of environmental rule, which is useful to look at how states, organizations, or individuals use environmental or ecological justifications to undertake what are really different forms of social planning or indeed territorialization. I take a livelihoods approach to help me focus on farmers, assets, or capitals. This includes physical, physical capital, such as farming tools, natural capital, like land and soil quality, financial capital, human capital, like good health and farming knowledge, and social capital, such as ties and networks. I look at access to these that are mediated by institutions and social relations that together determine the living gained by an individual or household. I'm also focusing on how livelihoods can be strongly impacted by shocks and trends, such as extreme weather events, changing prices for commodities, or particularly relevant in this case, changing state policies regarding rural development. In turn, we also then need to focus on farmer coping and adaptation strategies. I also want to draw from literature looking at the concept of infrastructural violence. This sees infrastructure per se as the concrete force of abstract power. In turn, infrastructural violence is the continuous processes of marginalization, discrimination and exclusion through and sustained by infrastructure, either passively or intentionally. In turn, I'm also interested in what's been termed infrastructural lives. This means to examine how people relate to, experience and negotiate infrastructural spaces and how that shapes the everyday constructions of subjecthood in a specific place. Now my borrowed context is the Southeast Asian Massif. And this is a term that was proposed by Jean Michaud, a social anthropologist in 1997 and then further popularized and expanded in uh, 2016. The Southeast Asian Massif is argued to incorporate the highlands of Northeast India, east of the Brahmaputra, Bangladesh, Burma, or Myanmar, Southwest China, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Peninsular Malaysia. And we're talking roughly an altitude over 300 meters. In comparison, the term Zomia, that you might have also heard of, or which has become more popular, was actually first coined by William Van Schendel in 2002, but was later reworked and made popular by James C. Scott in 2009. Now, while Van Schendel's conception of Zomia encompasses Tibet and its periphery, Scott's Zomia and Michel's Southeast Asia Massif cover a smaller but similar geographical area. For Michel, though, Zomia refers more to an historical and political understanding of the upland region, while the Southeast Asia Massif, the term that I draw on today, is more appropriately considered a social space or place. More specifically, I just want to highlight here the sheer numbers of ethnic minorities who are living in the Southeast Asia Massif, numbers that are often overlooked when we look at rural development occurring in the region.
Now, my focus is on the Sino-Vietnamese borderlands and while I work on both sides of this border, today I'm gonna to focus on the Vietnam case. I'm going to be arguing that through so-called rural development programs, the Vietnamese state is relentlessly working to bring ethnic minority communities living in the country's remote northern borderlands under the state's gaze, with the aim of changing local livelihoods to better fit state imperatives. This can be seen as an ongoing project to enclose these borderlands, aiming to integrate people into this periphery along with their lands and resources. This is being achieved through what political scientist James C. Scott has termed, and I quote, distance demolishing technologies, which he defines as including infrastructure projects such as highways, railways, the growth of urban centers, and hydroelectricity projects. Since the 1960s, these uplands have also experienced a number of other enclosure like so called rural development projects driven by the state. These include the creation of new economic zones with lowland populations encouraged to migrate to these uplands, the promotion of cash cropping and wage work, and an agrarian transition away from semi subsistence production. Since 1993, these strategies have also included strong encouragement of the tourism industry managed by local Vietnamese to spread across these uplands. Now, while these uplands are home to a broad diversity of ethnic minority groups, two important ones with pop by population numbers are the Hmong and the Yao, the two groups that I work with the most. There are just over 1 million Hmong in upland Vietnam, also known as part of the broader Miao group in China. And there are about 750,000 Yao. In areas where the climatic and topographic conditions lend themselves to rice production rather than maize, rice is at the heart of Hmong and Yao livelihoods. A household that does not grow enough rice to see itself through the annual agricultural calendar is considered poor by endogenous definitions of wealth. Bogi Niao harvest one rice crop a year in this high elevation area. They are both patrilineal societies and when a son gets married he inherits his own fields. And this practice is squeezing land availability along with the state discouraging the opening up of new terraces especially in areas near forests. Lowlanders establishing new land-hungry enterprises such as large-scale flower and vegetable cultivation, like these cabbage fields here, are also removing important rice terrain. Now, just to give a quick political context as well, ethnic minority populations have been in Vietnam at least as long as the lowland Vietnamese or King with the minority groups in Northern Vietnam originally arriving from China. In the 1930s, nationalist and communist forces in the North of Vietnam made promises of Chinese style autonomous regions for minority groups in a number of Northern upland regions if minorities supported the struggle for independence. Two such autonomous regions but as soon as the reunification war, the Vietnam War, was won in 1975, the policy was abandoned. Soon, in the communist rhetoric, upland minorities in Vietnam were considered to be at the lowest stage of economic development and in dire need of assistance, while the lowland king were deemed the enlightened majority, entering socialism the highest possible goal. The undividable unity of the country and nation and the active promotion of king culture became the priority. As a consequence, so-called counterproductive or superstitious practices of non-king groups, such as shamanism, animal sacrifice, lavish funerals or sweetening, were deemed backwards and targeted for eradication. Also called bad, so-called bad habits, such as crossing borders unchecked or owning firearms were also banned. On the contrary, as we see on this mural, other cultural activities, chiefly benign and aesthetic, were encouraged, including wearing colorful attire, singing, dancing, and playing traditional music. 
A very obvious example of this ideology soon came with the implementation of the new economic zones. The Northern Vietnam government's planned resettlement program of the 1950s and 60s. This transfer of people was initially known as, quote, clearing the wilderness or highland economic and cultural development and virtually ignored the ethnic minority communities already settled in the area. As James C. Scott has argued, this program aimed to demographically dominate upland ethnic minority populations, a classic example of territorialization. While this program slowly faded out in the early 1980s, a number of enclosure processes, including those I'm about to focus on, are active across these uplands. As this frontier landscape is continuously transformed, I firmly believe that it can be argued that minority communities are, are experiencing different forms of infrastructural violence through the state's continuous modernization policies and rural development schemes. So I now turn to my three examples. One of the modernization programs introduced by the Vietnamese state over the past 20 years and which impacts the majority of Hmong and Yao households is the promotion of hybrid seeds for rice and maize. Upland farmers are being strongly encouraged to use state subsidized hybrid seed instead of continuing their customary rice and maize cultivation, during which historically they could save land raised seeds from year to year and use organic fertilizers. While the state promotes its hybrid seed program, citing food security goals and rural development, Hmong and Yao households remain concerned for a number of reasons. One concern is that farmers now need cash to purchase hybrid seeds every year because the seeds are infertilized on the state to supply the seed in the most remote areas, which has led to shortfalls and delays in planting. In addition, the varieties provided are often not optimal for local conditions. There's only limited government efforts to develop and trial hybrid seeds appropriate for these uplands, rather than just assuming that lowland seeds will be viable. This has resulted in a number of crop failures. Most farmers I've talked to are also not thrilled about the taste of hybrid seeds compared to their own traditional varieties. While experiencing a land squeeze due to population growth and lowlanders starting new agricultural projects, minority livelihoods are also being squeezed by the state's push to create more upland national parks and forest reserves. Farmers have relied on non-timber forest products as part of their semi-subsistence livelihoods for generations and are now finding their access to these commodities being curtailed or straight out banned. For example, black cardamom is increasingly important as part of local ethnic minority farmers' livelihood portfolios and has become a significant source of income. Traditionally gathered from the forest for household medicinal use, over the last two decades, demand for this high value forest product has risen steadily, especially just across the border in China. Many Hmong and Yao farmers have seized on this opportunity to cultivate cardamom to meet their cash needs, especially so that they can purchase the hybrid seeds and chemical fertilizers that the state is so vigorously promoting. Black cardamom requires a closed canopy forest and one of the most intensive areas are in these Sino-Vietnamese uplands. While it is illegal to harvest black cardamom or other non-timber forest products in national parks, farmers in this region continue to do so because of their increased need for cash. Hmong and Yao cardamom farmers are meanwhile well aware of the need to protect valuable watersheds in forested lands, something that has been part of their own traditional ecological knowledge for centuries. Currently, there are additional forest reserves being planned in these uplands, and again, farmers will potentially be banned from growing cardamom where they have for centuries. This quote is from a Yao farmer living near a newly designated reserve. 
local authorities are now pushing cardamom growers to try other livelihood approaches, such as growing commodities that require more industrial processing, such as cinnamon, or suggesting farmers move into laboring jobs for wages and shift away from semi-subsistence altogether. In this case, this means narrowing livelihood options to more legible ones. We thus see the Vietnamese government using environment-focused policies as a justification for programs of socio-spatial reconfiguration and control, what can be considered environmental rule. Moving to my third case, since at least the mid 1800s, ethnic minority traders have been actors in a vast network of markets with trade extending to the lowland Red River Delta and across the border far into Yunnan. French military archival documents that I've worked with reveal that upland market trade was conducted in basic conditions. Goods were displayed on the ground, sometimes with thatched roofs and bamboo stalled structures. This has continued for decades. These periodic markets where farmers can turn up unannounced and sell what they want are now undergoing dramatic structural and organizational changes. Upland marketplaces are being, quote, upgraded as part of rural development, and numerous recent state directives are striving to modernize, stabilize, and formalize them. This entails eliminating what are regarded as, quote, unquote, controllable elements of marketplace trade. For instance, market trade sites that originate independently through the initiatives of local people, and hence meeting local needs and priorities, are deemed to be, and I quote from a state document, of concern and in need of evaluation. There is little evidence of marketplace, quote, modernization plans assisting minority traders, as numerous traders have explained to me that they are now denied information and decision-making power, and delays have plagued already ill-conceived market structures and sites incompatible with local trade routines. The state enclosure of marketplace trade also includes newly hired market managers, new trade fees and licenses, and fixed trading days. These all work to increase legibility, reducing opportunities for traders to operate flexibly or even under the radar. Market managers, who are state employees, now keep an eye out for illicit goods being sold at these fixed marketplaces, including non-timber forest products that might have been harvested in national parks. So once again, upland livelihoods are being documented and further restricted. Now, just as an aside, this is a mapping exercise to try to highlight the degree to which street vending has also been curtailed over the past 20 years in one upland tourist town. And for those of you who've been to Northern Vietnam, this is in uh, Sapa in Lao Cai province. The map highlights the uncertainty that ethnic minority vendors face as state officials consistently change the locations where they are allowed to vend on the town streets with little to no notice. The colored traffic lights show the inconsistency of sites allowed for trade on a year by year basis. And I'm happy to talk more specifically about this um, project afterwards. Now, if we return to the initial definition of infrastructural violence, it does seem clear that what we are seeing here are processes of marginalization, discrimination, and exclusion through and sustained by a range of different rural development and infrastructure projects, either passively or intentionally. As these forms of infrastructural violence have had a number of negative and far-reaching impacts on local livelihoods, often in slow and covert ways, I also suggest that these developments are examples of slow violence. Slow violence is a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight. A violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, and attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. 
Nonetheless, upland minority individuals, households and communities are not passive recipients of these changes occurring around them or the slow violence that they endure. And they have been pushing back in a number of different and subtle ways. And here I want to draw on political scientist Ben Kirtliad's notion of everyday politics to briefly explore some of their tactics. So everyday politics has, is defined as people embracing, complying with, adjusting and contesting norms and rules regarding authority over production of or allocation of resources and doing so in quiet, mundane and subtle expressions and acts that are really organized or direct. Everyday politics can take various forms, which quickly it clusters under four headings. These are support, compliance, modifications and evasions, and everyday resistance. Turning back to the hybrid seeds, we see compliance, modifications, as well as evasions of state expectations. Farmers with smaller land parcels are tending to have to take on the seeds for increased yields, but they're also shaping backup plans. Instead of buying seeds that often arrive late or are unsuitable for local conditions from state outlets, farmers are now buying from markets such as the photo here or they'll actually smuggle the seeds from China to get more appropriate types. State officials are not happy with farmers doing this, as they make officials look like they are supporting fewer households, which doesn't help with their own job promotion. And it provides less quantifiable evidence for the state to celebrate its support of upland households and rural development. Farmers are also keeping traditional seeds as backups the very seeds the state frowns upon as being outdated. Those with enough land hold out for as long as possible against state propaganda and keep growing traditional rice since it's so preferred for the taste. So we see here everyday forms of resistance acted out individually or collectively, but never as openly declared formal challenges. If we turn to look at national parks, to date, many farmers have managed to avoid having their cardamom plots protected by forest rangers, as these plots are located deep in the park where farmers, where, sorry, where rangers are unwilling to trek. Farmers have also learned to light the fires that they use to dry the cardamom in situ in the forests at night or in gullies to try to avoid being detected. Cultivators are also well aware that they have no control over the national and global markets for this commodity, leaving them at the mercy of possible demand collapse. They're also well aware that state restrictions might tighten up at any time. And this is a phenomenon they experience firsthand when growing opium poppies, a crop first encouraged by the state and then banned in 1993. In newly built marketplaces, traders have explained that their subtle resistance measures have included foot dragging during relocations, resizing their stores, and moving out of sight of officials to avoid paying newly implemented fees. Traders are also creating multiple new spatial practices of trade. Two examples include, instead of selling non-timber forest products at marketplaces where they might get confiscated if officials deem them to have originated in a national park, ethnic minority cultivators are now increasingly selling forest products door to door with known buyers whom they trust, like restaurant operators, and often doing so at night. In some areas, this strategy even includes a resurgence of the illegal trade in opium now being cultivated deep again in national parks and other remote areas. In tourist towns, such as the one where I showed the map of street vendors selling from small stalls, constantly being relocated, many minority vendors have decided to go mobile instead. By selling itinerantly from baskets on their back, like in this photo, these vendors can maintain a presence on the streets while avoiding their goods being taken by police. Other minority vendors have pushed back against these restrictions in other creative ways, such as by deciding to, forest, to follow tourists 
going on treks to local ethnic minority villages. These treks are often led by young minority women guides. Drawing on social networks with these guides, ethnic minority vendors informally join the treks as they head out of town and strike up basic conversations with tourists en route. They then go in for a hard sales pitch of their goods when tourists are resting or having their lunch. These vendors are thus negotiating, working around and contesting vending restrictions in numerous innovative ways to meet their livelihood needs. So as I hope has become clear, across these borderlands, there are numerous rural development, modernization, and especially infrastructure programs underway, aiming to integrate the livelihoods of ethnic minority inhabitants into the nation's economy and direct them towards full market integration. Other examples I could have drawn upon include dam construction, state education policies, new roads in their specific routes, and more. Infrastructures, both visible and invisible, are deeply implicated in not only the making and unmaking of individual lives in these uplands, but also in the experiences of community, solidarity, and struggles for appropriate livelihood options. At the same time, local people are working to affirm their claims of what they believe they are entitled to, based on their own understandings of fairness and rights including access to local natural resources, continuing cultural practices and agricultural techniques, and maintaining long-term trade routines. Rooted in situated knowledges and local cultural values, upland minority individuals and households are making livelihood decisions that are resulting in particular measured engagements with state rural development policies and infrastructure projects, and with the market integration that these types of projects are encouraging. These minority households, for the large part, refuse to completely abandon semi-structured, sorry, semi-subsistence livelihoods to follow capitalist opportunities. Thus, while the Vietnam state moves ahead with specific visions for these borderlands and their populations, local inhabitants are quietly and carefully continuing to create their own upland livelihood approaches and alternatives as best they can. So many thanks for your time and here are some relevant uh, publications in case they might be of interest. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the presentations from Professor uh, Turner. Hello, hello, Sarah. Can you hear me? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is the time for que uh, questions and answer. And uh, Professor Turner has been there with us. And I will start uh, with the one question first. This is from uh, Zaura. Uh, she said in your talk that the local farmers just holding out as long as possible as the backup plan to against the state propaganda. This makes the curious uh, makes her curious whether there is or not a discussions between state officers and the representative of upland ethnic groups to find the best way that not only should for uh, the new economic prog program imposed by the state, but also is jeopardize the local livelihood sources. Please uh, give the response for these questions. Sarah? Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yes, yes. Excellent. Well, one, 
once again, thank you so much for having me here. It's um, really a delight to be um, part of this conference. Thank you. I think this is a, a, a great question. Um, sadly, I have to say that these local communities are very seldom involved uh, in any sorts of discussion with the state with regards to suitable socioeconomic development. Uh, there's quite a paternalistic approach to these upland groups and the state uh, authorities really sort of come in and say, well, this is the way things should be done. It should be done as we do in the lowlands and hence you need to follow our directives. So as much as I would love there to be these kinds of discussions with local communities, uh, local communities are constantly telling me that this doesn't happen. Um, and there isn't really a very formalized system of sort of heads of um, local communities where those heads actually have um, the authority to be able to speak on behalf of the local communities. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that there are local sort of head representatives, but they've been put there by the state anyway. So the state is sort of just talking to the state and the people in the local communities who have like the knowledge, the, the long-term knowledge and could really make a difference, um, they're not talked to at all. Wow, those are some really interesting graphics going on there too. So I hope that answers your question, but um, unfortunately it's, it's not very positive at all at the moment. So there is no direct uh, discussions between well, the, the direct people? The direct discussions are state officials coming in to talk to sort of quasi heads of local um, villages, but those local heads of villages have been chosen by the state. And they really just represent what the state is telling them to say, uh, because we are in a socialist country. Um, so there isn't a lot of very open dialogue and what is open is amongst the farmers themselves, absolutely. Um, and when they get to trust outsiders, then um, they tell us their sort of concerns and issues as well. Um, but they're quite concerned that if they say the wrong thing to an outside state official, then it could get their village in trouble. Their village might stop receiving certain um, funding and things like that. So it's a very difficult situation for the upland ethnic minorities, but it is different in the lowland. So lowland Vietnamese villages do have a different relationship with the state. Okay. Actually, there are so many questions uh, raised by the participants, but uh, we now turn to the second questions from uh, Ms. Arini. Uh, the question is why there is no integration of political capital in the livelihoods uh, framework, while there seems to be a case of government pressure and debate. So that's another great question. Um, this comes down to what livelihoods framework you're working with. Uh, so the one that I'm working with is the broadest, I would say, um, use framework which comes out of the Institute for Development Studies in Sussex in the UK. Uh, so following the work of Ian Schoons and also quite similar to the work of Frank Ellis. And in those frameworks, and you can just sort of Google IDS and livelihood framework, the political aspects are actually a different part of the framework. So they do talk about policies, institutions, processes, and how those impact the vulnerability context that people are trying to make a livelihood within. But they don't actually make them part of the specific capitals that you're looking at at an individual level. So what they're saying is that that political aspect is more of the broader context that an individual farmer, for example, is working within. Um, just to add to that, I would also say that when you think about social capital as one of the five capitals, a, a person's individual relationship with an official 
And those ties and networks, I think, could certainly have a political aspect to them. And that's where you see the scale is sort of different in the different parts of the framework. But this has also been critiqued as well by others using different frameworks. Hope that answers the question okay. Next, next questions, if the time is still available. Is there any specific indicator to measure? This is a bit uh, technical, technical, you know, uh, to measure the socioeconomic change as part of rural development effect, like uh, increase of middle class number or decrease number of lower class or et cetera, something like that. Yes, so sorry. Point? Yes, so um, there certainly are. Um, so there are poverty indicators in Vietnam, and I think currently uh, the rate is 150 US uh, dollars as your average income uh, for a household. And if you are under that for one year, then you are deemed a poor household. Now, that is what the state uses to define and categorize different communities. And so that means that most of the upland minorities um, in the area where I'm working in Northern Vietnam, um, but also other ethnic minorities in the country um, are deemed poor. Now, what I find really interesting, um, just as a caveat to that, is that when I go into the communities and I say to a farmer, how do you yourself define yourself in terms of like poverty and or wealth. And I always get something along the lines of if a household has a house that's big enough to um, house everyone who wants to live there, if they have enough fields to grow enough rice to see themselves through the agricultural calendar, and if they have enough buffalo to work the fields and also um, for festivals, then they are deemed wealthy. So you can see it's a completely different understanding of wealth and poverty than the government. And this is where some of this complete disconnect comes in as well, in terms of how the government could be helping to support local communities. So there's really just this absolute, complete different way of looking at, you know, where we should be going and what should rural development look like. Okay, thank you for your response. Uh, it's a very nice an an answers uh, for those uh, questions list by the uh, participants. And then there is another question uh, from Ms. Yuhan Para. Uh, she is wondering whether the ethnic minority actually have bundle of power, like uh, whether it is structural or relational or right base that can be used to reclaim the access to their land and natural resources in the near future. Right, again, um, really fantastic questions. And uh, I do appreciate um, the time that's going into these. Um, one of the interesting things about Vietnam, and it's also the same in uh, Laos and China, as some of you are probably well aware, is that the state owns the land. This, the land is um, yeah, a, a state commodity and people have land use rights or land use certificates, I should say, that last for a certain number of years if it's deemed rural or urban. But this means that the state can reclaim that land um, if it's deemed necessary for some sort of rural development program. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is frequently done for um, hydroelectric dams, for roads, for marketplace extension, um, even uh, large tourism development. Uh, there's also, um, without wanting to get myself into trouble, uh, quite a lot of corruption. Uh, and so there are other ways that people that are very powerful or have powerful connections with the state can gain land. 
So in terms of the ethnic minority communities that I'm working with, who are already very marginalized in terms of political power, um, they have very few ways that they could openly or overtly try to push to gain their land back or land access back. And this is why um, we see them tending to use these more sort of everyday politics or everyday resistance approaches instead to kind of do the best they can with the access that they can manage to um, kind of eke out. I think uh, there is one more question. This, this, this will be the last questions. Uh, sorry. I should find the... This uh, there's uh, interesting questions. In Indonesia, we have what we call it a uh, village headman or kepala desa as the chief of the village. Uh, they are chosen by people of the village. Unfortunately, they act like they are the most powerful person in the village. In the case of uh, uh, Dana Desa or fund aid from the Indonesian government or village, Mostly the village headman decided the allocations of the fund by himself or people around him. There is no society, uh, so, uh, community meeting. Is it the meaning of the concrete or abstract power? How, how about this situation in, the, uh, in your research area? Okay, well, I think we have like two really interesting concepts here. Um, the quote in terms of abstract power was really to do with infrastructure. And it's the way that at the moment people are trying to broaden conceptualizations of infrastructure to be more than um, the tangible uh, things that we see, more than the roads, the dams, the marketplaces. Um, and so what that quote was trying to get at is the point that um, like the, the power relationships that are based not only on, you know, where a road gets built and who is going to benefit from that, but also whose land gets taken from that, all that is part of what we need to be focusing on when we look at infrastructure, not just, oh, look, there's this great road and now it's bringing village A and B closer together again. So that's sort of like one part of your question. The other part um, about the, um, the role of the, the head of the village, uh, again, in the uplands and the ethnic minority communities, what tends to happen is that a young man, and it's usually a man, um, is kind of pinpointed by the uh, government and told you're going to be the village headman. Uh, that person in the village will often have very little social standing, um, very little social capital, very little um, kind of power or prestige. And so the village elders, well, there, are, there aren't really village elders because um, it's a very elegant, ele sorry, egalitarian society. Um, but the village sort of older men who will cluster sometimes to make decisions like they don't really respect that younger man so much because they're like, well, you know, in terms of lineage and the, the way that the villages are built around clan relations, like he's obviously just someone the state has picked. So because of this, um, there's that sort of tension going on, but also uh, at that level, that person doesn't actually um, get to control a lot of funds or make a lot of big decisions. They're usually there to do things like um, break up a fight or if somebody has stolen um, someone else's cardamom crop, they're supposed to get involved and sort it out. So any real important decision making or distribution of funds is done at that higher level, which tends to be very remote from village um, expectations or hopes or dreams or 
realities really so it is yeah quite different i would say from the indonesia case but there's still that level of um perhaps corruption or not mm -hmm. quite things being done the way it should be it's just that it happens at a, a higher level so it's, it's it is quite similar eh? well kind of sim similarities and differences mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, it's just like where the problems are in terms of how local communities can be helped. Um, yeah, where those tensions are and where those miscommunications happen are perhaps at different levels. If you don't mind, there is one more question. Sure. Okay. Uh, there is one question from Ms. Hani. Uh, can you please explain the government programs that are used to balance economic growth and maintain environmental quality in the study area? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so there's quite a few. You see, uh, questions, but dif uh, difficult to answer, I guess. <laughs> Great, yeah, great questions. Very difficult to answer and to answer very succinctly as well. Um, there are actually a, a number of different programs in these uplands. They all have different numbers, like, you know, program 661 or program 331. Um, I don't know why they both end with a one. Uh, but they're different programs that the government has brought in at different times. Um, there's another one that was called the something like the 5 million hectare program. There are different um, reforestation programs or different anti-poverty programs. Um, they tend to last for sort of 10 to 15 years uh, and then get sort of rolled over and given a different name. So I won't go through all the different names because it's really just the list of names and acronyms, um, but some of them focus more on sort of anti-poverty uh, some of them focus more on the environment, mm. but then when you look at the ones that are talking about the environment, you really begin to see these concerns about this argument of environmental rule. And you begin to wonder, are they really trying to protect the environment at some stage? Or sometimes is it actually more to do with, we want to be able to say, you know, we've created X number of national parks, but it also means that we've had to move these communities and now we can keep a closer eye on those communities because they're right near the border with China and we want to make sure that they're not smuggling goods or they're not potentially um, trading goods without paying taxes or like who knows what they might be doing. Thank so, you. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah. sorry, carry on. Yeah, that's all uh, the questions that uh, can can raise to you and uh, thank you once again very much for uh, your time being with us and uh, giving the opportunity to uh, share your uh, research uh, results in the okay. Southeast Asian countries. Once again, thank you and that's all uh, for this session and we'll back to uh, Ms. MC. Many thanks. Thank thanks for having me. Thank you. What an excellent presentation from our keynote speakers. And also we have had a fruitful discussion with the keynote speakers. Thank you again for Professor Dr. Sarah Turner and Professor Dr. Ilham. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we would like to give you a piece of information. We will have a short break for about five minutes before we continue to the next agenda, which is the plenary session. And should be reminded that this plenary session would also be insightful and important for all of, for all of us, especially because we will have four speakers from four different countries. And let me read a bit. There will be Associate Professor Dr. S.K. Van Der Fit from University of Queensland, Australia. Professor Dr. Mat Nasir Samsudin from the University Putra Malaysia, Malaysia. 
Associate Professor Dr. Jangkung Handoyo Mulyo from Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, and Professor Dr. Justus Wesseler from Wageningen University and Research Center, Netherlands. So now, please have a short break for five yeah. minutes, and we really appreciate it if you could come back on time. See you in five minutes. Thank you.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us again. Hope you have a hope you have had a relaxing break. And now we'll come to the plenary session. This plenary session will be led by our moderator and kindly allow me introduce her as our moderator. Her name is Ibu Arini Wahyu Utami PhD. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Agricultural Socioeconomics, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada. She has research interest in socioeconomics aspects of climate change and in so, including resilience, as well as sustainable agriculture. She holds his she holds her PhD in public policy at Oregon State University. Master of Science in Agriculture Economics, Universitas Gajah Mada, and Bachelor of Agriculture in Agriculture Socioeconomics, Universitas Gajah Mada. She gained numerous scholarships, including Novik Neso, Sasakawa Young Leader Fellowship, and Fulbright. She also involved in various organizations, including International Association of Society and Natural Resources, and Society for Apolo Applied Anthropology. And please welcome our moderator today, Ibu Dr. Arini Ayu Utami. The time is yours, Bu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mbak Dian, for the very kind introduction. Uh, good day, professors, uh, participants, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, and students, both here in the Zoom webinar and in the live streaming of YouTube channel, Media Faperta UGM. So we are gathering here from several different time zones right now. So please allow me to uh, greet you good morning or a very early morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening, uh, wherever you are. I would like to welcome you all again to the first uh, international conference on sustainable agricultural socioeconomics, agribusiness and uh, rural development, or we call it ICSASAR. Uh, organized by the Department of Agricultural Socioeconomics, Universitas Gajah Mada. In this invited speakers session, we will hear from a panel of four disting distinguished scholars. Uh, first, we will have Associate Professor Dr. Elske van der Fleert of the University of Queensland, Australia, and then uh, Professor Datu Muhammad Nasir Shamsuddin of University Putra Malaysia, and then Associate Professor Dr. Janggung Handoyo Mulyo of Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, and then Professor Justus Wesseler of Wageningen University and Research, the Netherlands. From them, we will hear about communication for sustainable rural development, and then food security policy and the bioeconomy. Uh, we can connect this issue to sustainability concept as seen from the different lenses, uh, whether social, economy, ecology, and of course, their interlinkages, since each of the dimensions cannot uh, stand by themselves. And sustainability has become something really urgent in today's world with many challenges and unpredictabilities, including in agriculture in general and in agribusiness and rural development in particular. So before starting, uh, I would like to inform you that there will be Q&A session about 45 minutes in length at the end of this session. Uh, we will take questions uh, from Zoom and YouTube. And for those of you who are uh, on Zoom, please write your questions uh, either in English directly or in Bahasa Indonesia uh, in the Q&A uh, box uh, on Zoom. Or if you are on YouTube live, uh, please uh, write your questions on the chat box. And then I will read them at the Q&A session. Uh, don't worry about uh, your Bahasa Indonesia uh, or English, we have a very super assistance to translate uh, your questions uh, into better English, if you may say so. So now please allow me to introduce our first invited speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Elske van der Fleert of the University of Queensland, Australia, who will speak about communication for rural development, the transformation of agricultural services towards adaptive management of sustainable farming systems. Uh, so Professor Elske um, is the uh, director for the Center for Communication and Social Change or SCA at the UQ Australia. And her research interests includes transdisciplinary for sustainable development and communication for social change. Um, 
I'm sorry. She obtained a PhD in communication and innovation in 1993 from Moheningen University, the Netherlands. And then she joined the UQ School of Journalism and Communication, now School of Communication and Arts in July uh, 2006. And before that, uh, she has worked for about 20 uh, years or so in research, development, and teaching positions in Indonesia, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka, with a work also across China, Kenya, Uganda, the Philippines, and Kyrgyzstan. So Professor Elske's research interests include participatory development communication, facilitation of transdisciplinary research for sustainable development, and impact assessment of social change processes. And over the years at UQ, she has been conducting research projects in Indonesia, Timor-Leste, the Philippines, and Mongolia. She has published widely on a range of topics related to participatory research and communication in sustainable rural development. So without further ado, let's hear a directly for a presentation or, and talk from Professor Elske. So for Professor Elske, uh, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Arini, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone who is uh, here at the panel. Uh, particularly, thank you to the to the um, Panitia for inviting me for this uh, very interesting um, conference. I'll share my screen. Um, so yeah, a long title, and I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction. So uh, I, I suggested uh, this title really. Uh, to, re to be able to reflect myself on you know over, 40, over 30 years of experience or engagement uh, with the agriculture extension and rural development system in Indonesia in particular, uh, where I've seen many, many interesting initiatives and some great impacts on the ground, but unfortunately not that many changes in the system that would allow these great initiatives to sustain over, over a longer term. So change still happens a lot through short-term projects. Uh, each of which seems to be reinventing the wheels of how to do things better. Um, so I would like to address um, in this presentation those aspects, you know, why it is so important to look actually at transformation of the system rather than doing great projects. Um, and I will, um, so I will start, uh, my presentation is basically um, a build on all those terms that are in the title, working backwards from uh, looking at what sustainable farming systems are, why they require adaptive management, what agricultural services uh, need to be to, to support that, um, then what kind of transformation is needed, and then uh, reflecting on how communication for rural development can uh, support all those processes uh, and uh, end up with a conclusion. So sustainable farming systems. We know that farming, of course, is the, um, is the, is, is the, uh, the production and, and keeping of crops and animals for food and fibers, and that there's different systems. There's subsistence uh, systems versus commercial, and there's a lot of farmers, particularly in Indonesia, who are somewhere in between. Uh, and the majority of farmers, again, in Indonesia and, and other countries in the region, are still smallholders. Uh, for, you know, for, uh, and, uh, for that reason, they, are, they very often have mixed uh, systems. And I've had a lot of extension officers who would always tell me, like, you know, when we had a project, like, oh, farmers aren't focused, you know, we can't work with them because they do too many things. Well, we have to understand they do many things for a reason, and, and mainly it is to reduce risk because they cannot actually afford a lot of risk by only uh, relying on one crop. So therefore, we have to look at, at their way of farming as a system, and a system can be defined as an integrated whole made of interconnected parts which together are more than the sum of its parts. So, and that's why those uh, acknowledging those different parts of the system is so important huh? because what is happening in the end in people's livelihood is the product of the interactions of those different parts. And in terms of sustainability, as Sarah also just presented is we have to look at that balance between the economic, human, social, environmental, and fiscal capitals to be able to come to a more holistic uh, approach into, into looking at, at, at livelihoods and supporting people in their livelihoods rather than what a lot of projects have done in the past, mainly looking at economic growth. So therefore, being adaptive in the management is so important because it's, sustainability is not served by just 
straightforward adoption because you know a system you know with a lot of different parts is different from place to place from farm to farm from area to area and so sustainability is served by adaptation not by adoption uh, and it is important therefore to find that sweet spot between those economic human social environmental targets in the community and in individual families in regions but that requires very very often specific knowledge and specific practical skills and not necessarily generic uh, knowledge and skills, but in particular what I've learned over the years, the, you know, is the critical skills that are so important and with critical skills, I mean the ability to be able to analyze one's needs to find the, the solutions that may work for you to to uh, test them out to analyze them and then to adapt them to your specific situation. And to be able to, to do that, we need to have access to information, to exchange and learning opportunities, to diverse services and to infrastructure to support that kind of adaptive management of our systems. And then, of course, everything now happens within the context of the sustainable development goals. So it is no longer just only about you know, being able to uh, raise incomes of farm uh, families or to, you know, to support to national economic growth. At the same time, we will have to look, you know, in farming systems at conserving uh, and sustainably using um, biodiversity in ecosystems, so SDG 15 or 12, the responsible consumption and production, or still, of course, poverty alleviation. Uh, if not most importantly at the moment, the urgent action that is needed to combat climate change and its impact. So these four are major um, uh, kind of parts of the agenda in agricultural um, development, if not some of these other ones that I list there, like gender equality, um, uh, clean energy, economic um, uh, decent work, economic growth, inequalities, and also life below water. So it, it's a very complex situation, but if we don't tackle that complexity, we will not be able to, to achieve the, the sustainable um, uh, development agenda and not support actually those who need it most. So what does it then mean in terms of agricultural services? If we look at and of what we are dealing with in the overall set of agriculture services, of course, we're very familiar with the public services, which is in Indonesia agriculture extension system, which is a very ex extended and expense, uh, expensive system, um, expanded system, uh, where there's a lot of local presence of local extension offices and local um, extension centers all over the country. But very often we see that the, the ones who are working on the ground are underskilled. And I'm not, not saying they're not knowledgeable or skilled, but they are underskilled in terms of dealing with all those you know, diverse aspects of the system. You know, they're, they're very often specialists if they had a bachelor's degree, for instance, in livestock management, but sometimes they need to know about, about uh, fisheries or about something else if they work in a particular area. And most importantly, they're very under-resourced and, you know, salaries are low, so additional um, um, activities are needed to support their own families and their ability to organize things and travel around is very limited. Um, of course, there are a lot of, uh, and even more now with, uh, with the, uh, the local, uh, the district autonomy is that, that a lot of projects and programs, but still we often see the commodity focus, they're quite short term, particularly with the funding cycles of being one year and often funds arriving late, you know, only having a few months to do things. Um, they're very output rather than outcome focused, and they often use the local agriculture extension system and that may be in a very innovative kind of project, but without actually transforming the system. We also see that is the private um, um, uh, agricultural advisory and, um, and, and input provision services. So that's the company's marketing and advisory services. Again, they are either commodity or pro uh, product focused. Of course, they are for commercial gain. They are, they are business after all. And usually they tend to have better skilled um, staff and they are better resourced. So it's very difficult for an extension officer to actually compete with somebody who comes and promote a product uh, you know, from a company. And then of course, there are the open source um, uh, services or you know, information that is available and even you know, learning activities. And we often, more and more we hear farmers saying, oh, I'm an autodidact, you know? So it is, it's kind of people access the mass media or the internet particularly to learn new things. But very often it is, it's difficult to understand 
you know, in what context that information is applicable. It's not necessarily specific for that context. Uh, context. And then also we have to look at accessibility in terms of technology. Does everyone have that access to the internet, for instance, or to, to, um, to, to, to journals or, or magazines? Do they understand the language? Can they afford actually that access? So a lot of things we have to, to think about. So transformation is, is not just a change, you know, and we see that the, the system has particularly the way I, what I described earlier, that agricultural a change in agriculture development has been very centered on technology. It is still very often transferred, transferred through messages and packages and a one size fits all because that's a lot easier to plan and to, and to budget for and to implement particularly in a large country like Indonesia, but the country is so diverse, so it doesn't necessarily um, does fit. Um, and of course, these are planned in that way to serve the national and regional targets because we have to tick off the boxes. So the transformation that is really needed to be able to serve that more adaptive management is really a system of co-learning and co-innovation that is people-centered. Right? It's through education and particularly, as I said earlier, that critical skills development it is context specific, yeah? so the one size does not fit all, that it has to be adapted and it has to be tailor made almost. Uh, and it needs to serve the improvement of those complex livelihood indicators, not just only economic growth or, or the national uh, indicators. And therefore, we have to think about how we learn ourselves differently, how we, how we, no, we, go, we go to university and we, we go into this job to support farmers, but usually at university, we, we, we get really experts in a certain discipline. And we see that still a lot of initiatives apply the dis disciplinary approach where we, you know, from a problem, we apply the discipline, we come up with a great solution. If we don't have it yet, we go back to the problem, keep on. Uh, looking until we find a solution that can be communicated either through scientific publications, which is still very important for our own careers, or through advertising and marketing if we are a business, or through education and training if we are more engaged with civil society. And then we hope that change happens, and if it doesn't, we either blame the communication or we need to go back to the problem. Now, we know now that this system, that this way of working usually does not work in these complex systems by itself. So we see that a lot of multidisciplinary approaches, you know, we try to integrate kind of dis different disciplines, but they in multidisciplinarity, multi just means many, you know, they just basically still do their own thing and they hope that through the communication, eventually it will be put together and change happen. Again, we have seen that usually does not really do the trick. And so therefore, in the terms of sustainable development, we, we have now been talking a lot more about transdisciplinary a transdisciplinary approach. And I just wanna, before I, I would like to explain how I look at that, I would um, just mention that of course it's interdisciplinary as well, which I find is in between multi and transdisciplinary, but I will not uh, go into detail at this moment. So what is a transdisciplinary approach? That is where we have a problematic situation that where we need to apply several disciplines uh, to be able to solve it, but we actually acknowledge the sustainable development agenda as part of the agenda as well, uh, which automatically means that all the partners that are active, you know, within that agenda and that, that are implementing the action and facilitating the action, they need to be involved in defining the problematic situation and defining the ways to find solutions. So that really requires that, that kind of that, that crossing of, of boundaries of our different areas and understandings. And it's no longer only the disciplinary knowledge, it's also the, the indigenous, the traditional knowledge, and it is the, the, you know, the, the opinions that the people have who eventually have to, to make the changes on the ground. So communication is an extremely important uh, you know, as a platform to carry uh, understanding that situation and finding ways to, um, uh, to address the, situ the situation. Um, uh, and communication in this sense is not just uh, giving outputs, but it's about facilitating the dialogue, you know, um, between experts, community, policymakers, and industry to come up with a holistic set of 
um, of, of ideas that people can then take and adapt and test out and make work in their own areas. And so the solution are not separate solutions, it's an integrated solution uh, that can then still be communicated through education and training or the advertising and marketing and scientific or popular publications outlets, but as an integrated kind of set of ideas and, um, uh, and, and an understanding of how it can be adapted to different situations. And the change is then actually a recurring cycle of, of continuing to test and adapt and improve. So that's a very different way of working and it requires very different communication system, particularly to facilitate, facilitate this process of change. So, and this is particularly important if we think about sustainable development being, uh, and this is a, a derived from a definition from two people already quite a while ago, actually, who, who were Fraser and Restrepo Estrada, who, who did his work for the Food and Agriculture Organization. It's where they said, if development is ways to help people toward a full awareness of the situation, the options for change, to resolve conflicts, to work towards consensus, to help people plan actions for change and sustainable development, to help them acquire the knowledge and skills they need to improve their conditions and to improve the effectiveness, then communication for sustainable development and sustainable rural development is the communication, is the use of communication processes, techniques, and media that does all this. And that's exactly that platform, that red kind of bubble in the back of all the other things happening that I just show, showed in the other diagram uh, that can help facilitate that and, um, and, 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 and help determine the direction of the of the process of change. So it's a dialogical process. It's not just sending out messages. It is inclusive and should be empowering. It should be comprehensive and it is facilitating. And here's another way to look at it is that same, you know, that same platform of communication being the, the, the platform to carry the different phases of a change process so from the diagnostic phase where we want to understand together what the situation is, the planning phase where we try to understand, you know, uh, uh, get together with all the stakeholders from the, the various um, um, categories, uh, plan together to get into the action phase and then the change phase. So what does that mean then in terms of transformation of research development extension fun functions? First of all, of course, it requires partnerships as was quite evident from the, the previous slides. So within institutions, across institutions, and with private sector and community. And that's not easy because usually, you know, we write our own project, have our own little bit of money to do our things, and we are accountable to actually show that what we do um, is, um, you know, we're ticking the boxes of what we promise to do. But partnerships is now one of the sustainable development goals, and we really need to take that seriously and, you know, to look at how we can work together across community research the research community, um, and we, uh, also the education community, government and private sector. The other area to, to think about when we think about transformation is that we need to think about the tailor-made design and not the one size fits all. So that requires a diversification of ideas, you know, general ideas uh, by region, you know, because of different climatic, environmental and even social um, uh, um, uh, indicators, uh, diversification by farming system, diversification by socioeconomic class, gender, ethnicity, you know, because then only we can clearly support people to become empowered to make that change and develop those critical skills and, and access the, the, the necessary um, uh, capacities to be able to make the change for themselves. So again, communication there is extremely important. Um, to make that happen, both the partnerships and the, the, the tailor-made designs. And then, of course, we have to consider time. Time cannot, the change cannot be rushed if we look at sustainable change, but any time we need, uh, it's often used as a kind of, as a, as a comment why, why we can't do all those participatory approach because it takes too much time, but actually doing it right from the start may take time, but we gain time at the end because we don't have to start all over again. And so we need longer term programs and we need continuation of teams and particularly also con continuation of funding. Just the one year kind of funding cycles are, not, are never going to be you know, uh, uh, able to or allow us to really make a, sus a sustainable change and particularly institutional change. 
And then also we have to look at the indicators for change. Yeah, we, uh, in addition to the, the, the traditional production and economic indicators, we also need to look at the human and social indicators. We need to look at the effectiveness of processes so that we can actually um, kind of prove that the process did make a difference if we do it this way, and that we therefore also will be able to be funded to do things, to continue doing things differently um, uh, in a better way. And, so, and that requires also looking at institutional indicators. For instance, as a researcher at the university, if we do this kind of work and we don't publish in the highest quality disciplinary journals, what does it mean for our career? So, but actually, do we have to, what do we, what do we choose? High, high quality journals or impact on the ground? So in, in a way, the impact on the ground needs to be recognized by institutions for our own personal careers as well. Um, so that then requires not just, you know, better projects that do good things, but it requires transformation of that institutional context. And, and, and part of the institutions, of, of course, are the capacities. You know, what kind of people do we get in our institutions that are able to, to, to work in a more holistic way and across, you know, with others in partnerships um, to, to, uh, to contribute to the larger agendas? It requires uh, a transformation institutional structures, and it requires also a uh, transformation in policies and funding mechanisms, as I've already indicated before. So in terms of capacities, of course, formal education, and um, we need to start in our universities by, yeah, of course, still we need experts. We still need to train people in the discipline, but we also need to train them in being able to cross the boundaries of our own discipline and being able to communicate and collaborate with others. And actually at the University of Queensland, we're just designing a course for undergraduate students from all uh, fields that will do that. And we are starting to offer that next year. Um, and we can look at professional development for those who are already in the institutions. In terms of institutional structures, it's from sector discipline based to more transdisciplinary thematic based um, um, arrangements and also the incentive system as I addressed earlier and in terms of policies and funding mechanisms it's about more integrated livelihood targets uh, commitments to sustainable and, sus and sustained change processes that really you know support uh, better programs and initiatives and again communication is going to be extremely important to carry that and and support that uh, those uh, the transformation in those different areas so thank you very much. I look forward to further discussing this with you. Wow, wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Elske. So I, I, I get several uh, main points here, especially that communication for sustainable rural development is among others intended to empower the agriculture sector in general and farmers in particular. But it needs or requires partnership from all the stakeholders that involve. All right. So. Uh, let's welcome our second speaker uh, of today, which is uh, Professor uh, Datuk Muhammad Nasir Samshuddin of University Putra Malaysia. I'm here. Yes. Um, committee. Can I share my... Uh, oh. Can you see yes. my... Uh, yes, very good. Very well. Good. But my... Uh, But my video, my video is still not working. Oh. So you cannot see me. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. No, no, uh, the, the host has stopped it, actually. The host oh, has, mm, yeah. interesting. You have to enable. Oh, you, uh, Professor Nasir, you are just promoted. You are just being promoted as a co-host. So I think you now can operate your video again. Would yeah. you okay, 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 no. Can I start now? See. Yeah, I can, can see, see you. Yes, yes, yes. We can yes. see you well. Very All right. Well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arimi Wahyu Utami. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Good morning. Assalam. Good morning. First and foremost, of course, I would like to extend my utmost appreciation to the organizers for inviting me to share some thought on issues which is we believe is very, very important now is on food security. So the outline of my presentation will be first on the 
looking at the issues, second on the food security, and thirdly on some possible policy option. Eh? These are some of the, uh, I would say, some issues. Uh, it by no means exhaustive, but these are some issues that, you know, uh, that is much related to food security. Uh, basically, ASEAN countries is in the process of transformation from agriculture based to industrial base. So it's, the issue is whether uh, this food security is inclusive in the, in the economic transformation. And of course, very, very important that also we have to touch on the post-COVID-19 pandemic. Eh? Of course, everybody is affected by the pandemic now, but I think the, the, the effect will be for the next three, four, five years. We don't know, but I think the effect will be there for quite some time. So I think food security is, 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 is certainly affected. And all of the issues, I will, I will discuss briefly on all these uh, issues. Eh? First, looking at the, uh, whether the uh, food security is inclusive, if you know, most ASEAN countries now is basically in the process of transformation. Eh? Like in Malaysia itself, we have transformed from agriculture base uh, before mid 1980s and now moving toward industrial countries. So also Indonesia, and I believe so also other ASEAN countries. Eh? So this, this transformation basically, we look at the, uh, the share of agriculture GDP, of food production GDP, which is the overall GDP. Of course, data in Malaysia indicate that you know, when before mid 1980s, our GDP, as far as agriculture, is about you know, more than 20%, but currently it's about 7.5%. So they show whether this transformation is inclusive in terms of, you know, when we move from agriculture to industrial base, whether our food security is still being handled properly, whether we have not enough food for our population or not. Secondly, in terms of the poverty elevation, and also whether it reached the socially and economically disadvantaged. So if we can handle all this in terms of food security, in terms of poverty, in terms, you know, that our, our economic transformation, uh, improvement in income and so forth has reached the socially and economically disadvantaged, then basically the food security has been inclusive. The transformation is an inclusive. Yeah? But that yet to be discussed. Secondly, in terms of uh, COVID, uh, post-COVID-19 pandemic, huh? so basically with all this COVID, with the lockdown, Malaysia also still locked down, I believe Indonesia and all over the, all over the world, yeah? We open back, we close back, open back, close back on our economy. So all this basically will have some impact in terms of improve, increase in poverty somehow, eh? and also increase in food insecurity. Eh? So whether we talk about food security today, but with all this pandemic, basically we improve in terms of food insecurity. This is data in Malaysia. I don't have data in Indonesia. So with all this pandemic, basically, you know, loss of job, 2.4 million people, eh? Uh, 46 percent estimated unemployed eh? so all this eh? so all this basically and then loss of job loss of income and of course this translated into uh, uh, improvement of the uh, no, not such improvement increase in terms of food insecurity basically that you know last year uh, our economy contract by 4.5 percent this is basically negative 0.45 percent and of course um, unemployment also increased by 4.2 percent that was last year but this year, of course, the World Bank also basically cut this year uh, GDP for 2021 at most be 4.5%. We never know. We never know because, you know, but it, I don't think it will go to 4%. But anyway, hopefully we have some positive expansion in our economy. But this is like yesterday's, for example, you know, the effect of COVID uh, in Malaysia. In Malaysia, basically, we divided our population into T20, which is, you know, high income levels, M40, and also B40. So the data indicate that, you know, half, more than half a million people of, of M40 household has fall, has dropped into B40 category. Eh? So, and also the poverty increased by 8%. So these are some of the issues in terms of the, uh, currently, how, how, how can we handle this in terms of the security? Eh? Next will be on, of course, population increasing. Eh? That in Malaysia will be increased about 41.5 41 million in uh, 2030. And the data in Indonesia, for example, by you know by 2035, it will be more than 300 million people. And 
as far as globally, by 2050, because of increase of population from seven odd billion to nine, nine point odd billion, then of course they need increase about close to 70% of food production. So whether we can achieve not like this. Yeah? And then looking at the uh, uh, improvement in income, but this is before COVID. So somehow improvement in income, uh, if you look at the data in Southeast Asia, uh, most of the countries has been I mean, they are, they are, they are, their capital income has been increasing over the years. So the effect is that there has been changes in terms of uh, food consumption patterns and also changes in the diet. Looking at the data in Malaysia here, basically with our improvement income, we are not only increase in terms of the in term of quantity, but also increase in terms of improvement in terms of the quality. So the demand. So back then, of course, when we're talking about the demand function for food, we're talking about in terms of quantity. But now we are talking about the demand for food quality. So there have been changes as improvement. If you look at here, uh, this data indicate over the years that you know the per capita consumption of beef, vegetables, and also fruits has been increasing basically. But the per capita consumption of rice has been declining over the years. So in Malaysia, in general, I'm talking in general. But of course, for the for the lower income group, still normal good. Uh, in, 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 uh, but but in terms of uh, uh, in terms of in general, of course, uh, the rise has been basically in terms of imperial good as far as economic term. That means as our income increase, the per capita consumption we used to consume per capita basis about 120. This is in 1980s, you know. But now it's about about 80 kg per person. That's dropped a lot. Yeah? Because of course we, we tend to consume more beef and protein based food in terms of right? looking at the uh, factors in terms of food supply. Looking at the data in terms of uh, RD spending, uh, somehow in Malaysia and Indonesia, as indicated here, our RD spending as a share of agriculture GDP has been declining over the years. But Thailand has been, of late, has been increasing. But this is data until 2016. Yeah? But this is very important for us to look at because normally there is a positive correlation between uh, productivity of food production or agriculture production and also R&D. So, 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 so the, the intensity basically in Indonesia and Malaysia has been declining. So this has been, as far as Malaysia is concerned, has been in translated into low SSL. SSL is the uh, subsistence levels. So basically, we we we, we uh, import a lot of food, basically, yeah? um, especially for the main food item like rice, mutton, beef, milk, dairy product, uh, fruits, and so forth. Yeah? So 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 this is very much concern because not only that you know we import uh, our food a trade deficit. It's around 18.5 billion ringgit. This is a ringgit. So one US dollar about 4.2 ringgit now. Eh? So you can convert to US dollars. And you can convert also in terms of rupiah. But anyway, our concern is not that, you know, is that the trade deficit is, is a lot, it's, it's very much, but somehow the, the trade deficit is increasing over the years. And this is the, this is what we are very much concerned. Eh? It's okay to import food, actually. Uh, no problem to import food. And then the food that we can produce, but we shouldn't import basically the food that we produce our own. But this also back you know, from the economic perspective, whether we have competitive advantage or not. But then, of course, in terms of food security, although we don't have much competitive advantage like rice, but still we have to produce our own. Yeah? So this is, of course, where the government policy, we want to increase our, our rice production. Yeah? So, and then other than that is in terms of the food price. Yeah? Uh, somehow during the COVID and of course last year and this year, uh, in general, actually the food price has been increasing over the years. Uh, this has some, of course, affect the, the lower income group. Uh, this is very much concern in terms of the accessibility of the, of the food security. Yeah? Uh, next, in terms of food waste, um, the issue in, uh, in, 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 in South Asia, especially, and in Malaysia particularly, uh, well, we don't have enough food, basically. That's why we have, we import a lot. I mean, our import bill is more than 50 billion. Yeah? But at the same time, 
we have a lot of food waste. A bigger problem than with the last two years. So in Malaysia, for example, we produce 38,000 tons of waste per day. And from that pile, actually, 15,000 make up food waste. So every day. This is every day. Eh? So about 8,000 8, 8, tons out of that 15,000 tons or 60% are food waste which is avoidable. That means still can be consumed. Eh? And of that 8,000 tons, about 3,000 actually still very much edible. So, so this is the issue that our food consumption habit, eh? while we are, there is a food price increase, there is a shortage of supply, that's why we import a lot, and at the same time, our habit is that we waste a lot of food. But this is not only particular in, uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia, but you look at the uh, uh, food loss, total waste, eh? low-income countries about in general 10%, eh? but high-income countries is much less. Well, high-income countries, they have basically their food surplus, but in terms of food loss, total waste is very much less compared to low-income countries. This is some of the issues there. Yeah? So other than that, in terms of uh, urbanization, huh? uh, of course, uh, urbanization basically because people in urban areas, they are normally a net buyer of food. Huh? So this is the issue whether we can have urban farming. Huh? So in Malaysia, for example, 70% of the population is urban areas. And, and this is currently, I, I would say in the next 10 years or so, we're close to about 80% people in urban areas. But this is not mainly due to that, you know, partly of course due to people uh, migrating from rural areas to urban areas, but also uh, the rural areas have become urban. Actually. <laughs> so that's why, you know, in terms of percentage has just increased eh, from, from uh, urban population. Eh? Of course, other than that, issue of climate change, as I mean, all, 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 all of us are aware, huh? because somehow uh, this climate change has affects our, our productivity, as indicated in this, uh, in this, uh, in this data, huh? and also in terms of energy food nexus. Huh? So, because agriculture now, or food production, is not only for uh, uh, for food and fiber, but also can, uh, because in terms of multifunctionality. Huh? And also in terms of environmental preservation, biodiversity, ecotourism, and so forth. But more importantly is that you know when we, in one hand, we have a population which is, you know, not enough food, but on the other hand, we use food for energy, for example. So this is where the balance of you know of our food production. Eh? So whether we're in the world, of course, there are a lot of hungry people. And yet we use the food not for human consumption, but also for energy and for other purposes. So this is where the policy has to be balanced in terms of the uh, food for food for food and food for energy. Yeah? So this is an issue. In terms of food security station, so just now briefly, you know, because of the time constraint, briefly I just discussed about some of the issues related to uh, food security. And now I'm talking about food security station. This is in terms of Global Food Security Index, Malaysia and Indonesia. 2020. So currently, Malaysia is ranked 43, Indonesia 65. Okay. This is just a figure. But the problem is that looking at the, uh, uh, from 2018, 2019, our food security ranking has improved a lot. Actually. Yeah. So in 2018, uh, 2019, 2019, uh, we are ranked, no, 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 uh, Malaysia is ranked uh, 28, eh? and Indonesia ranked 62 in 2019. In 2018, Malaysia was ranked 40, and Indonesia 65. There is a lot of improvement. But our concern is that in 2020, the, rank, the ranking declined, where Malaysia was ranked 43, and Indonesia rank 65. So we have improvement in terms of ranking of food security index from 18, 2018 to 2019, but then the ranking declined in 2020. What was happening actually? Uh, of course, partly because of uh, uh, COVID-19, but if we talk about COVID-19, so also other countries are also experiencing COVID-19. So that means something is not correct. I mean, as far well into 2020 in, in both Malaysia and Indonesia. Looking at the data for Malaysia, 
decline in ranking is mainly due to availability yeah? because this ranking they take into account of the affordability, availability, quality, and safety, and so forth. Yeah? If you look at the uh, uh, 2019 and 2020, as far as availability of food in Malaysia, ranking based on ranking uh, has declined from 26 to 36. So this makes the ranking, overall ranking of Malaysia has declined. Eh? Uh, this is partly because in 2020, I mean, we did not handle COVID-19 properly, basically, eh? because there is a lot of disruption in the in the in the supply chain, yeah? and a lot of uh, uh, let's say, for example, vegetable production in the, in the producing area has not really moved to the consumption area in those uh, in, the, in the so so there is a lot of bottlenecks of uh, in 2020. So this make the food availability has declined. But for Indonesia, I don't have the data, but I presume it's about the same. I tried to probably. I will call it in Kajamaka. I tried to search for data, I could not. Yeah? But this is anyway, probably is uh, due to the availability also, yeah? but I'm not sure. In terms of the uh, global hunger index, uh, really we are only moderate, not low. Huh? So of course, if low, then it's very good. Huh? Uh, Malaysia, we are about 13.3, which is moderate. Indonesia, I think I have data from Indonesia. Yeah, Indonesia also is moderate, 19.1. Lower the better, actually. <laughs> because talking about hunger index, the lower is better, the better. Yeah? So in this case, um, uh, but countries like, you know, like uh, Turkey is less than five, which is very good. Like China is less than five, which is really low. But basically, this is the, the status of our global index. Yeah? Uh, this is some of, so, of course, the uh, index um, in the ASEAN countries, eh? Indonesia 70, uh, Malaysia 57, this, like that. this is in 2020, I guess. Eh? Talking about food insecurity status, a situation in Malaysia, uh, why there's, in, in Malaysia, there's one in, so we want in. Uh, when we thought, always thought, you know, our economy has been improving over the years, you know? Per capita, income, per capita income also has been improving over the years. But then, studies by, you know, this is studied by Rushida, published in general, medical journal, that 13.4% of adult Malaysian basically both reduce the size of meal and skip main meal because of the financial constraint. Eh? Of course, in East Malaysia, uh, much worse compared to West Malaysia or Peninsula Malaysia, and rural, 18 urban areas. But I'm not sure this data is correct. Eh? Because for me, basically, in people in rural areas shouldn't be hungry. But, but the data indicate that, you know, 18.8% of people in rural areas, rural areas have food insecurity problem. Eh? So also study, other study by Zalila here, but, you know, for 2008, eh? that 50% experience food, food insecurity. Uh, they have studied in one of the area, study area that's in Sabah Panam. Eh? And 34.5% child hunger. Really. So, so basically, they borrow money to buy food and reduce the meal. So, this is some, I would say, some snapshot, some uh, picture huh, of situation in Malaysia in terms of food, food insecurity. But in Indonesia, of uh, course, uh, prevalence of undernourishment has declined actually huh, from 16.5% in 2011. To 9% in 2019. So this data indicate that you know uh, in Indonesia, of course, 19.4 uh, million people are unable to meet their dietary requirement, and 37.2% of children are under under five are stunted. Let me see, they are not in diet, basically, or protein, or, you know, so they have, uh, so they have normal growth. Eh? So this is some special of the food insecurity in Indonesia and also. So having said that, then what are the possible policy responses to address the food security? Yeah? I think we all know that basically that you know uh, food security there are basically four components. One is in terms of the availability of food. Yeah? Uh, this availability of food, uh, availability of food in a nation can be either we produce our own or we import. Yeah? I mean, food is available in our country. 
Secondly, in terms of accessibility, once the food is available, whether the people can can get access or can buy the food or not, eh? can get access to the food. And thirdly, once people can get access to food, whether the food is um, uh, what's called uh, can be utilized or not, and whether food is safe to be consumed or not, and and then fourthly is stability, whether the food is always stable over the years. Eh? So in that case, then how to improve food security? Of course, eh? because food security is not only in terms of improving productivity, but of course it can improve either by increasing the food supply. Eh? Of course, uh, if we have more food supply, then of course we can have improvement in terms of food security. Second, in terms of the access, access to food, in terms of accessibility. And thirdly, in terms of the was it just not in terms of the utilization, which is in terms of food quality and safety. And finally, or possibly in terms of stability of food. Yeah? So before I present in terms of some possible um, initiative or policy option, some policy consideration that we have to know is in terms of the uh, we have to tackle public policy in terms of food demand and also food supply. So we have to develop instrument yeah, which, influence, which influence employment and income. Of course, as I said just now, food security is not only in terms of food availability, but also in terms of food accessibility. Of course, if they can improve the income, then of course, they have better access in terms of food. Food preferences, and also consumer knowledge in terms of food safety, in terms of health services, uh, food price stabilization, and also safety net programs. These, these are some of the um, possible policy instrument in order for us to influence the food demand. In terms of food supply, then of course, in terms of policy, there are a lot of intervention, both in input and output market, uh, in terms of price, trade policy, marketing policy, input subsidies, and so forth. Eh? Input market, for example, like subsidy in terms of fertilizer, subsidy in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms of seed and so forth. Eh? These are some of the input market. In output market, for example, like price support, uh, and tariff, quota, all these are basically some of the intervention in order for us to protect and to improve and so to protect the local industry. Yeah? And of course, provision in terms of public goods, public goods here yeah, in terms of infrastructure and also R&D. Yeah? Of course, as I said just now, R&D, of course, there is high correlation between the amount of spending in R&D and also in terms of productivity and also in terms of infrastructure because with good infrastructure, of course, it will, will make the food distribution more efficient. And also more importantly is that how our policy can enable smallholders, producers yeah, to participate in agribusiness management through equitable access to local, national, and international. So meaning that you know the equity of economic growth of agriculture transformation must also benefit the uh, smallholders uh, producers, whether the product can be not only can be marketed locally but also in terms regionally and also in terms of the international. So that's some of the points. Uh, so. Then what are the some policy, uh, some policy option? Yeah? In terms of availability, in terms of consumer care, uh, I think the situation in Malaysia and Indonesia is about the same. Yeah? If, if anyone comes to Malaysia, basically reaching the airport, Kuala Lumpur International Airport, and going to UPM, for example, my university, or going to Kuala Lumpur, you can see a lot of palm oil, basically. Upon landing also, every, everywhere is all pump, all pump, pump, all pump, all pump, all pump, all pump, all pump. So what does it indicate? It indicates that pump, all pump is more lucrative compared to food production. So basically, it is not that food production is not profitable. Yes, it does profitable. But then as an investor, of course, somehow the fact that there are a lot of oil pump in Malaysia, uh, you know, one of the... I mean, Russia, of course, the biggest producer, but we are the biggest exporter, indicate that the relative profitability of oil palm production is more than food production. Therefore, it is very, very important for us to have some incentive 
or improving the market failure, improving the parity return. We have to have a policy. Uh, this is, of course, has been handled by the government because I'm also in the advisory panel of the ministry. That the, the return of food production must be at least at par. At, I mean, about the same. We service what we call uh, all power production, or in Malaysia, we call it industrial crop production. Until we handle that, because we don't talk about our food quality or food production, because every bag is all about that, number one. Number two is we have to somehow have to emulate, uh, the word is emulate, to emulate the plantation crop model, like all palm, basically. The very success of all palm in Malaysia, very successful, and also in Indonesia, team, because there is coexistence between a big plantation and smallholders, meaning that they have win-win situation. Smallholders, basically, they cannot market their fruits if there is no meals, basically. And that meals actually belong to the plantation. And plantation normally, they have excess capacity. So they have to buy the fruit from smallholders. So this is where, if we can emulate the, the business model of production crop, then probably our food production can, can improve. Then of course, the food security. That's number one. Number three, in terms of, we have to recognize the multi-person of agriculture. So meaning, when we buy, for example, we buy chili. Actually, we are just buying the price of chili, the output of chili. But actually, when we plant the crops, actually, or plant the rice, it have other benefits in terms of environment, in terms of landscape, in terms of uh, climate change, everything. But this we have not really recognized. We have not payment environmental services that they produce. We have not really paid. Yeah? So if we pay these environmental services, payment for environmental services to promote production, then of course, there is a lot of, I mean, the food production will be more productive. But the question then, of course, when the price increase, the consumer will be negatively affected. But of course, there are other policy instruments that we can, you know, the market price for the consumer remain the same, but we can have some payment to the producers so that they have more to promote their food production. Eh? And then of course, lastly, in terms of ability will be entrepreneurship. Eh? So I think, I think, I think now it's- Excuse me. I'm really sorry, Professor Nasir. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, time's up. Yeah, can uh, we have uh, you in the last two minutes? Okay, yes. Okay, two minutes. <laughs> when we talk, sometimes we don't realize. That. Okay, anyway, this is in terms of the entrepreneurship. Next will be in terms of accessibility. Uh, we have, for food, just now we have a lot of food waste. Huh? How can we have sustainable food consumption? We have been talking a lot sustainable food production, but I think now it's time also to talk about sustainable food consumption, food bank program, enhanced skill, to the uh, to, uh, to improve uh, to access job offered by the growth or rural, rural non farm and so forth, yeah? and then utilization just now in terms of improving the market failure by converging the private and social of family of food safety yeah? because you know uh, the fact that there are a lot of unsafe food because probably there is not much incentive for the producer really to have hundred percent to save food. That is the fact that there are a lot of unsafe food, yeah? and of course last but not least in terms of holding in the form of strategic food security reserve as the first step of defense in emergency. So these are basically some of the uh, strategies basically that we can in terms of policy in, in terms of how can we improve food safety. With that, Dr. Rini, uh, thank you for, <laughs> for taking the time. Huh? So thank you very much for sharing. So later, if there is any Q&A, I will be very glad to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very, uh comprehensive uh, talk from Professor Nasir. Um, but we would like to first apologize for not introducing you properly at the beginning. So can can we please ask for Mas Putra to share screen and... Uh, I stop sharing now, yeah? yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you, Professor Nasir. Yes, so uh, I know that this is a late introduction, but um, at least we introduce uh, Professor Nasir uh, to the audience. So Professor uh, uh, that Professor Datuk 
uh, Muhammad Nasir Syamsuddin of University of Putra Malaysia is an agriculture economist uh, who for the past three decades has taught and research issue related to agriculture development and international trade. And he has supervised and co-supervised 60 PhD, uh, 30 master graduates. He has also worked as a consultant for the ADB, Asian Development Bank, Economic Planning Unit of the Prime Minister Department and various government agencies. Uh, currently, he is the member of National Agriculture Advisory Council under the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry. And uh, until now, he has authored and co-authored more than 250 publications in book, book chapters, and journal articles, and presented in more than uh, 170 international conferences in his area of expertise. So yeah, that's, oh, oh I'm sorry. Hmm. In recognition of his academic and leadership capabilities, uh, he was appointed as head of the Agricultural Economics Department, head of the Agribusiness and Information System uh, Department, and then Deputy Dean, School of Graduate Studies, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Studies, Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, Dean of the Faculty of Forestry and Environment, and Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International at the University of Putra Malaysia. That's a very a lot. Uh, list of experience and he was a visiting scholar at the center for agriculture and rural development at iowa state university uh, at the united states and the department of land economy university of cambridge okay yeah that's a late introduction of professor nasir and uh, basically i can uh, summarize that food security uh, we can see the lens uh, from several different dimensions uh, which comprises of uh, availability, which uh, include uh, supply, and then access, utilization, and stability with surrounding issues around stability, including climate change, stability of food prices, interna international trade, among others. And improvement uh, on the food security should take uh, into account all dimensions, not only one uh, dimensions uh, by themselves, and covering uh, whether the micro, meso, and macro level. So from the community level, individual level, household level, even the farm levels to the national level. So yes, uh, that's a, a presentation from Professor Nasir. Let's continue to the, the third uh, presenter, which is uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Janggung Handoyo Mulyo of uh, UGM uh, Indonesia. Uh, can we read a CV of Dr. Janggung? Yes. So Dr. Janggung is currently the Department Head of Agriculture Socioeconomics, uh, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. And uh, his research interests include uh, agriculture and food policy, uh, price policy, food security, food self-sufficiency, and food sovereignty, among others. And then agricultural cooperative, entrepreneurship and marketing, environmental and natural resource economic, international trade and supply chain management on agricultural commodities, uh, population and economic development issues, rural and regional poverty issues, rural economic and sustainable agriculture development. That's a very humble introduction of Dr. Jiangkung. Uh, so we know that uh, he has also very active in uh, national organizations uh, within Indonesia and have author and co-author um, several books uh, not i'm not sure several is the correct word many books uh, uh, book chapters uh, journal articles and so on and now let's uh, hear presentation from uh, dr janggung handoyo mulyo uh, for dr janggung the screen is yours thank you very much uh, dr arini uh, let me to share my uh, PowerPoint. Oh, Excuse me, I could not share my screen. So is there anybody can help me? Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, panelis sudah. Mungkin panjang bisa saya sekian lagi, Pak. Nah. Yang ini, Pak. Cincet tombol yang tanda atas. Ini di-close dulu. Um, good morning, uh, distinguished uh, guests. Uh, today, I would like to uh, share uh, about Indonesian food policy, challenge, achievement, and lessons learned. The outline of my presentation today, uh, including role of food, current condition of Indonesian uh, food policy, as well as sustainable food policy. Then uh, my presentation will end by giving lesson learned. Okay. Uh, as we have already know that uh, food is very important uh, uh, for our life as well as for uh, human civilization. Therefore, at least we recognize uh, five uh, important role of food for our life. First. Uh, uh, Food is provide nutrients. Then uh, the second one, uh, food is also source of all energy. And the third one, uh, food is building all part of my body. Uh, the fourth one, uh, food can be used as a weapon to win in a negotiation. So in terms of uh, political economic issue, then food is also very important role because uh, Every country, especially those who have uh, 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 enough food, then they can uh, surprise other country in order to win in their negotiation. Therefore, food also can be used as a weapon. And then uh, the last uh, role of food is to shape our civilization. Without food, uh, we believe that our human civilization could not sustain. Therefore, food really very important for our uh, country as well as for uh, all human beings. Then let me to uh, show this graph. Actually, we are going to uh, show that uh, we are trying to uh, inform about uh, rice production as well as party field in Indonesia during 20 years, from 2000 until 2020. Uh, from this graph, we can look that uh, rice production, rice production tend to increase, then decrease, especially since uh, 2017. On the other hand, uh, we also look here that um, land, agricultural land, tend to decrease significantly. So therefore, it is a challenge for our country, for, our, for Indonesia, that even, even rice production increase around 0.56% per year. But if we look at the condition, the condition since 2016, then uh, the production tend to decline. It is a really challenge for our country and we have to take into account this thing uh, when <clears throat> we are making um, food policy. So, okay. Then uh, in, the, in the next slide, uh, we are going to show that uh, rice production, rice production on average, from 2000 until 2020, yes, still grew about 0.56% per year. But again, again, if we look at since 2016, 2017, then uh, the uh, rice production tend to decline also. 
So uh, it is a warning for all of us that uh, we have to improve our rice production. Then how about if we look at uh, consumption? The data from 2000 until 2020 show that Indonesian rice consumption increase. Indonesian rice consumption increase. Yeah, here uh, that uh, on average uh, the growth of uh, Indonesian rice consumption 0.60. So we can uh, image that in the near future, the need for rice consumption always increase and increase. It is really challenge for our country with the population for about uh, 260 million. It is not easy, but we have to do. We have to solve this problem. Then uh, the data about Indonesian rice import. We also see here that although uh, in Indonesian import rice is fluctuate, but uh, the trend is uh, what we call still uh, still exists. Yeah, although although negative, but we can see here that uh, import of rice always increase, especially especially in a certain years. For instance, in 2011, for instance, in 2060, 2018, so our import quite big, yeah, quite big. So it is also uh, 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 important for us that uh, we have to uh, solve this kind of rice import. Then uh, I'm going to show the percentage percentage of uh, rice uh, uh, rice imported compared to uh, those uh, produced in the world. Here, yeah. from 2006 until 2019, we know that the condition of uh, global rice world trade uh, the average of world rice traded is only 5.32. What does it mean? It means that uh, the number of rice that available in the global market is very thin. So therefore, those countries who have huge population, they have, to, they have to encourage to produce their rice as a staple food domestically. So we need food self-sufficiency. Otherwise, we will get the problem because only 5.3% of rice uh, traded in the world market. So it is a uh, condition of, uh, of uh, uh, global rice market. Therefore, uh, for the country of, uh, for instance, Indonesia, we really need to, uh, to be self-sufficient in terms of rice. Then uh, I'm going to show here about uh, the relation between uh, population and GDP. Here from the graph, we show that the population always experience growth over the time, population, as well as the national economy. However, the challenge is that the average Population growth is 1.29% per year, while the national rice production growth 0.56% per year. It means that uh, the growth of population higher than the growth of national rice production. So if we consider about uh, Malthus population trap, we have to uh, remember that it is a uh, it is a uh, uh, condition that we have to take into account uh, whenever we decide uh, the policy, especially uh, policy uh, regarding to uh, uh, population planning, so, because uh, the average population growth is higher than uh, growth of rice production. 
then we are going to see about uh, how about uh, distribution of GDP, distribution of GDP uh, by uh, island. Here we can see that uh, almost 60% of our GDP contribute by Java Island, almost 60%. While if we look at the distribution of Indonesian area, Java Island, only 7% of Indonesian area. So you can consider that Java Island only 7% of Indonesian area, but the contribution in terms of GDP almost 59% or 60%. The other fact is that uh, if we look at the distribution of population, Java Island reside by almost 56% of the population. Therefore, a lot of Indonesian people, they stay in Java more than 50%. And if we look at the rice production, on the other hand, Java Island, which is only 7% of Indonesian area, Java Island contribute 56%. So what can we learn from those two slides? is um, we need to, what we call, we need to improve in terms of uh, development, whether economic development, whether industrial development, whether population development, and also price development strategy to move outside from Java Island. Because uh, if we do not move to, uh, outer Java, then everything will concentrate in Java. I mean, everything is the GDP, population, as well as price production. Therefore, it is not good for our development. We need to make equalize the contribution of each island. Of course, it is not uh, equal island by island, but if uh, we look at this uh, figure, then there is a domination, quote unquote, of Java Island in terms of economic contribution, in terms of population resident as well as uh, uh, rice production. So uh, it is a strategy that uh, we have to uh, consider. Of course, it is not easy, but we have to do now. Otherwise, we will get the problem in the near future. Now, I am going to uh, look at about the human resources in ag Indonesian agriculture, that is the farmers. This graph want to show us that uh, how uh, the distribution of Indonesian farmer, considering by their age. From this uh, pie chart, we can look at that uh, the Indonesian farmer is dominated by old farmer. Indonesian farmer dominated by the old farmer. With the age of uh, those farmer more than 50 years, it's about 59%. So we can uh, imagine the capacity and also risk of the old farmers in uh, facing uh, what we call today's challenge. Therefore, therefore, we need to uh, farmer regeneration. In other words, farmer regeneration is a must for Indonesia in order to strengthen uh, the performance of uh, uh, Indonesian agriculture, especially in providing food, especially in providing food, because uh, majority of Indonesia uh, eat rice. We can say that every day is rice. No day without rice for almost all Indonesian. 
Therefore, we have to provide enough food, especially rice, in order to maintain our uh, population. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, we are going to share about uh, still uh, Indonesian farmer considering their education level. If we look at the education level of the Indonesian uh, farmer, then we look here from the pie chart that uh, those farmer also dominated by farmer with low education. Almost 74% of farmers who have no education at all, who have no education at all, mean that they never come to the school. Yeah, it is a fact. Yeah, the data shows about that one. And also those who finish elementary school. So those two uh, kind dominated in Indonesian uh, farmer by education. Therefore, we need to strengthen farmer capacity. We need to strengthen our farmer capacity through the informal education, whether in terms of agriculture extension, training, field school, workshop, and etc. We need to strengthen our farmer capacity because of uh, education. Considering the previous uh, slide that I have already uh, explained that we need sustainable food policy uh, to uh, solve uh, Indonesian uh, condition. At least there are, uh, uh, there are seven uh, policy. First, sustainable food production. Yeah? Sustainable food production. We have to produce food uh, enough otherwise we will get the problem the second one sustainable local food diversification sustainable local food diversification the third one sustainable agriculture land conservation we need to conserve our land we need to conserve our land because uh, agriculture could not uh, uh, sustain without land Agriculture could not uh, maintain without enough uh, agriculture. Therefore, we need to uh, conserve our agriculture. And the other policy is favorable food pricing policy. We need a pricing policy that uh, motivate a farmer as a producer in order to uh, improve their production to support our population. The next policy is capacity building for human resources. Capacity building for human resources. As I have already explained previously that uh, Indonesian farmer dominated by low education and very old farmer. Therefore, we need to improve uh, their capacity. And the next one, is sustainable water resources and climate change management. We know that uh, Indonesia is, is an archipelago that the distribution of water among the island is uneven. Therefore, we need a strategy in order to support uh, agriculture production. And also, we have to adapt with uh, climate change. The last one is agricultural institution development. We, 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 we have to uh, have a policy about uh, institution to support sustainable food policy. So this one is Indonesian food policy. So uh, here we uh, look uh, aspect of agriculture from land, water, livestock, and fisheries, farmer, climate, and land. So uh, in its, uh, uh, in speech, its uh, 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 of uh, agriculture, we, we have uh, several experiences. For instance, in terms of land, we need to 
uh, uh, convert. We have a high agricultural land conversion. We have narrow ownership. The ownership of agricultural land spread out. Therefore, government already uh, uh, make a constitution on agricultural land uh, conservation. Conservation, and then in terms of water, we need to policy, especially how to uh, use water as efficient as possible. In Indonesia, we have already implemented about water saving cultivation, or we call it as SRI, 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 system of rice intensification. And in terms of livestock and fisheries, we need to integrate it farming to minimize outside input. Then, uh, in relation to climate, in relation to climate, climate cannot be controlled by human beings. Therefore, we have to adapt with those situations. Indonesia have many programs, especially uh, program Kampung Iklim or uh, Climate Kampung Program. That is a program to uh, uh, to to strengthen, to empower uh, people in the rural area in order to uh, adapt with the climate change. And then in terms of farmer, as I have already informed, we need uh, informal uh, education. We need uh, regeneration in order to uh, sustain our agriculture. Okay, and this slide want to show that there is a relationship. This is the case of COVID-19. There is a relationship between number of uh, people, number of people uh, uh, having COVID and number of country that implement uh, food trade restriction. What what can we see from this graph is that every country, whenever they got a COVID-19 pandemic, then they try to, to protect their, uh, their citizen first. Yeah. Many countries, they cancel commitment to import rice. Yeah. It is very common because as I have already explained earlier that food also can be used as a weapon. And every country, whenever uh, face a COVID-19 pandemic, that they have to save their population first, their citizens first. So it is a good lesson that we can get from COVID-19. Then the next slide, uh, try to uh, introduce about farmer uh, exchange rate. In Indonesia, we call it as uh, NTP. Nilai tukar petani, farmer exchange rate. So uh, here uh, we can look at the graph that uh, the farmer exchange rate fluctuate. But uh, one thing that we have to consider here is that in March 2020, when the government declared that there is a first uh, uh, first COVID-19 case. At that time, the farm exchange rate still 100.09. But after that, the impact of COVID can be seen here that COVID-19 uh, reduced the farm exchange rate from 102 and then decreased to become 69.47. Uh, Indonesia just recover from uh, uh, COVID-19 in terms of uh, farmer exchange rate on uh, July 2020. At that time, the farmer exchange rate to be improved to become 100.09. Nowadays, uh, our farmer exchange rate already improved well. Yeah. The last data that we have got on August is uh, 104.5. 68. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Jangkung, yeah. would you please to finish in about two minutes? 
please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very Ms. much. Arini. Yeah, to uh, conclude my presentation, uh, let me to quote a word of uh, wisdom from Dr. Norman Corlo. He was Nobel, Prize, Nobel Peace Prize winner. He said that there is a relationship between food and civilization. He said, civilization, as it is known today, could not have evolved, could not have evolved, nor can it survive without an adequate food supply. Therefore, it is important message for our country, maybe for, for other country in the world that we have to uh, produce our food enough. Self-sufficiency is important for our country. If we are going to be, uh, 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 if, we, if we want to be uh, uh, a good country, sustained country. So that's all. Thank you very much. Time for the moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Jangkung, for the wonderful and informative uh, presentation. So uh, just one sentence to summarize that food policy should also address sustainability aspects uh, besides the economic, uh, also uh, to cover the social, the human and ecology on, or environmental aspects because all are interlinkage. And uh, last but not least, uh, let's continue first to the introduction of our last speaker, Professor Justus Wesseler from Wageningen University and Research. Yes. Uh, okay. So Professor Wessler will talk about agriculture in the bioeconomy, uh, economics and policy. And um, yes, so Professor uh, Wessler uh, is the chair in agriculture economics and rural policy at Wageningen University, Wageningen University, the Netherlands. He has a degree in agricultural, environmental, and natural resource economics from the University of Göttingen in Germany. His research work is on bioeconomy, uh, economics, and policies. The major focus is on the contribution of value chains to improve sustainability and the impact of new technologies and regulation on the value chain in this respect. His research work has been published in more than 100 contributions to peer-reviewed journals and books. He is the member of uh, the International Consortium of Applied Bioeconomy Research, or ICABR, and editor of the Palgrave series on bioeconomy, economics, and policies. He has been involved in a number of small and large-scale international research projects as team member and or coordinator, and been invited to serve as an advisor in academia and research. Currently, currently he is the coordinator of the EU-funded project monitoring the bioeconomy or biomonitor and a member of the EU high level expert group to assess the needs, potential visibility and approach for an international platform for food system science or IPFSS. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, hear a presentation from uh, Professor Wessler. Uh, for Professor Wessler, the screen is yours. Yes, um, thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be invited uh, to this uh, conference. It's a pity that we cannot meet in person and I hope in the near future that uh, might be possible uh, again. Now I try to share my screen. Let's see if this will work out. And now I have to find my presentation. I think that it should be share, okay. So I should go to the first slide and go into full presentation mode. Yes, I hope you, you can see this, my presentation now. Yes, very well. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. As I said, it's a great pleasure uh, to be invited uh, to this esteemed group of uh, colleagues for giving a presentation on agriculture in uh, the bioeconomy. Now I have uh, 20 minutes, so um, I will not be able to cover all the wide ranges of important issues uh, that are relevant. So um, I will focus on some of the mayor uh, issues and may skip some parts uh, of my presentation. For those who are interested in receiving more details, please just drop me an email and I'm very happy to share uh, 
the reports that we have uh, written on this important topic. Now, uh, the bioeconomy has increased in importance over the past, let's say, uh, uh, decades. And in the world, there are uh, many definitions about what basically the bioeconomy uh, consists of. Um, it is often related also to the circular economy, uh, to green growth. It is differentiated into subparts of the bioeconomy, for example, bio-based economy, which includes the conversion of uh, natural resources into useful products. I have listed here the uh, definition of the European Union Commission, which means, uh, which says it's the production of renewable biological resources and their conversion into food, feed, bio-based product and bioenergy. And it includes not only uh, the agriculture sector, but also forestry, fisheries, food, pulp and paper production, parts of the chemical and biotechnology and energy sector. So it's a, a very much encompassing uh, uh, concept. Now, uh, when we like to assess the uh, importance of agriculture to the bioeconomy and the uh, contribution of the bioeconomy to sustainable development, then we have to consider that this is a very complex issue. <clears throat> we have summarized this here in the conceptual framework where you have on the one hand, if you would like to stimulate sustainable development, some driving forces that have an effect on the use uh, of biomass for bioenergy, biomaterials, food and feed. But we also have to consider that, for example, food and feed uh, can be residues from food and feed production can also again be used them for bioenergy production and remains from the bioenergy production may be used for biomaterials and also parts of the biomaterials conversion can move into the food and feed uh, sector. So there's a, a high uh, uh, circularity uh, present uh, in the conversion of uh, biomass. And the uh, overall objective is, is then to contribute to social, uh, societal uh, um, objectives that are related to food and nutrition security, sustainable natural resource management, um, and uh, more. What is also important to consider that the development of the uh, bioeconomy, including the agriculture sector, also uh, depends on the policy strategies and legislations uh, surrounding uh, the bioeconomy and also depends on the availability of uh, natural resources such as land, water, but also labor and the possibility to convert um, byproducts. As I mentioned, um, why this is uh, becoming important. Um, this, um, the main drivers are the advances in biological sciences we observe an increase in horizontal and vertical integration in the whole uh, supply chains. We have observed an increase in inter and intra industry trade advances in information and communication technologies and something that we would summarize as an increase in globalization that is uh, import that are important drivers for the uh, developments that we have observed. And as I already mentioned, there's a lot of circularity within uh, the sector and the um, uh, uh, vertical integration. Here are some examples, for example, in the bio, uh, biotechnology sector or in the uh, dairy uh, producing sector where we have observed this. We also have observed this increase in international trade as well as in intra-industry trade as highlighted here in these slides and information and communication technologies have uh, um, increased and we will see the implications of uh, globalization. One example, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are also issues that are related then to the spread of uh, pests and uh, diseases. Here's an example uh, from a food uh, a crisis in the European uh, Union, and there are many more examples. Now, um, the, the relevance of, of uh, the bioeconomy is related to its contribution to food security, sustainability of uh, the management of natural resources. There's the objective also to reduce uh, the dependence on non-renewable resources, 
the issue of climate change to mitigate and adapt to climate change and from a socioeconomic perspective also to uh, create jobs and then at country or regional level also to uh, maintain uh, competitiveness. Now, one of the overarching uh, concept there is sustainable development. And one of the big challenges is um, how do we uh, assess uh, sustainable development? A number of uh, methods have been proposed, for example, ecological footprints, uh, gross national happiness index, as ex for example, uh, um, done for Bhutan. Uh, the UN has uh, developed the human development index, the World Bank, uh, the genuine savings, and other colleagues have uh, um, developed what we call now the genuine investment, which is basically the change in the economies economy set of capital asset weighted at uh, shadow prices. And if this looks positive, then uh, we are on a sustainable development um, path. What needs to be considered when we look into sustainable development is uh, the issue of um, external effects. And there is a big challenge for us in the economic sciences. If you look at um, external effects that we have to consider that in many cases, externalities have often been internalized uh, via uh, specific government policies and Indonesia, the European Union, the United States, other regions of the world, for example, have policies to address climate change. In, uh, they introduce taxes, for example, on the use of fossil fuels or gasoline and more. And uh, to consider these uh, internalization effects is important to identify to what extent uh, we are on a sustainable uh, development path. And we have to consider that also uh, the private sector, the farmers, uh, the food uh, sector and others also do take environmental issues into consideration uh, when they develop their uh, business plans as of course to a certain extent they are also affected by some of the environmental pressures and they respond to this and we also have to consider this in our uh, assessments now um, there's one important issue and that goes back to the rio declaration that is um, the issue of, uh, precaution, of the precautionary approach, that when we do such kind of assessments, then we also have to take into consideration that some of our actions may cause irreversibility effects or irreversible uh, damages. And those damages need to be taken into uh, consideration. And as the Rio Declaration says, even if we don't have a lack of full scientific certainty, this should not prevent us from postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. So if we, even if we do not have full scientific certainty, we should behave careful and uh, not shy away from, from implementing uh, preventive uh, measures. Now, this, of course, is uh, from a scientific point of view, a, a strong challenge, as it might not be so easy to identify when we are talking about serious irreversible damages and what level of uh, uncertainty should we take in, into consideration. Now, um, I like to introduce here the concept that philosophers have used to look into um, uncertainty. And um, there's a famous philosopher, uh, Blair Pascal, and, and he said, for example, with respect to whether or not you should behave according to a specific deity, a specific God, well, we cannot exclude with non-zero probability that that God does not exist. So it would make sense to behave as if this God would exist in case we would be punished if we would not behave according to what that God wants us to do, right? So behave on earthly life as if this God would exist. Now, that seems to make sense. Now, there's uh, the opposite argument is, well, you cannot exclude that one God exists, but you can also not exclude that not another God may exist, and that other God may punish you if you believe in the other God, right? So then what shall we do? So that kind of reasoning, non-existence, cannot disprove, does not really move us forward in deciding how we should behave. Right? And economists then say when it comes into uh, irreversible 
course, to be considered in this case, if he links this to the examples of the gods, punishment when you have died and, and be moved into hell. Well, how can we take care of this uh, uh, irreversibility effect? And uh, what economists then uh, suggest is even so we have difficulties to quantify this irreversible costs, let's look at what we know. And that is here shown in the right hand side of this equation, where the W indicates uh, the possible welfare benefits that we might get from changing our action. We take into consideration what are irreversible benefits that we are often able to calculate. And then we have something, this is this beta over beta minus one. That is an indicator for measuring uncertainty. And that ratio is larger than one. So you divide your benefits by a ratio larger than one. And this gives you a threshold value, this I star, for the irreversible damages we should be willing to accept. And then we can assess whether or not we meet this threshold level. And as long as we are below this threshold level, then it would make sense from an economic perspective to continue with our action. And if we are above this, then we should postpone, not necessarily uh, ban. And this we can also then put uh, further in, into uh, uh, action. For example, there are issues that are related to new technologies in plant production. Uh, if you think about genome editing and more, there we have debates about whether or not a specific product should receive approval. And it's not only the technological aspects that play a role, but also the political aspects. And here's the example that I show that is related to the approval of a starched and hand a potato uh, variety, which caused a lot of political upheaval in the European uh, Union. But what this shows is that these issues often play also a very important, uh, uh, that are often very uh, important as well to consider. The other aspect, if we look in, into these issues of uh, irreversibility, that we have to also consider the dynamics of uh, our system. For example, how pests uh, develop over time and space, and this may also have an effect on the uh, threshold level. To summarize this, uh, and that is here illustrated in this figure where we have on the horizontal axis, the benefits from a new technology, V as a value, and then on the uh, vertical axis, uh, what we call the option value and the irreversible costs. And if you look at the black line, this I1, which illustrates the initial irreversible costs and then a straight line, and where this intersects with the horizontal line, that would be normally the threshold level that we would use to say, okay, let's go ahead from a cost benefit analysis. It would uh, generate positive benefits benefits to the right of this intersection. If we add uncertainty and irreversibility effects, then we observe that this threshold level has to be larger. So for example, V1, V3, or V2. Now there comes the important thing. If we increase irreversible costs, for example, by policies due to uh, approval costs and other uh, measurements, and we have a downward movement to I2, then one additional unit of extra costs, irreversible extra costs, needs more than one unit of additional benefits to compensate. And that's why economists are very much concerned or interested in, not necessarily concerned, interested in what are the effects of policies with respect to the incentives to develop new uh, solutions. And here are some examples about uh, uh, extra costs uh, related to regulation. This is the example of a, a um, GMO uh, technology, but this applies to other technologies, agriculture, machinery technologies, ICT technologies as well. And what we can see if we look into the uh, uh, development of new technologies and, and policies, uh, that the uh, uh, approval costs, approval lengths, whether we talk about GMOs, ICT, et cetera, that they normally decrease over time, but in some cases they might over also uh, increase and have a substantial effect, as I already mentioned, on the incentive uh, to uh, invest. Uh, now, I would love to use finally one of uh, an important example why this matters, and that is related uh, to uh, technologies or in, 
in improvements that have an effect on human health. And here's the example that I use uh, uh, golden rice, which is a vitamin A enriched uh, rice that addresses the vitamin A deficiency among children, which is widely spread in South Asia and Southeast Asia and also uh, in Indonesia. And colleagues have developed a, a a rice variety that has a higher content on vitamin A, which is missing in conventional rice. And this can contribute to reduce vitamin A deficiency, not to completely eradicate this. And uh, the, uh, the uh, benefits, if it's uh, distribute between irreversible and reversible benefits are substantial. Now, the question is, why has this rice variety not approved? If you look around the world, it has only received currently approval in the Philippines a few uh, weeks ago, but it will still take some time I, until we will see the first rice varieties being cultivated uh, in the Philippines. And the main reason for having these delays is related to policy. It's not a technological issue. It's a policy issue that has resulted in the delay. And the question is, can we just justify this delay in uh, the approval of this new technology, taking into consideration the potential health benefits that might be delayed by having only access two or three or four more years later. Now, with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and to summarize. So we have to consider for sustainability assessments that agriculture is deeply embedded in the bioeconomy. And that is more than just looking into the food systems. Food systems are part of the bioeconomy, and we have to have a more holistic view and take into consideration the interlinkages with other parts of our economy. The uh, developments in the bioeconomy, they also provide new opportunities for agriculture development, offer new uh, investment opportunities, new, new opportunities to convert biological resources into something that might be useful beyond food and feed. What is also important to consider is that if you think about sustainable development, that this is not a technological problem. It's an institutional problem. And that has that is what we have to take into consideration when we assess a sustainable development. And what we observe from the empirical studies that have been done, that regulation of new techno uh, technology seems to be crucial. And we, over what, we observe wide ranging effects uh, due to an increase in horizontal and vertical integration in supply chains driven by the regulatory environment. And with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and thanks a lot for your attention. Happy to take questions. Oh, what a well, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wesseler. Uh, now uh, we come up to the Q&A session. We have received many, many questions. And um, Yahya or Mas Putra will uh, help me to present the selected questions. So actually, uh, we only have about uh, 45 minutes. Uh, and hopefully that we can cover all of the questions, but uh, not sure about that, but let's try. So, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Before we begin, uh, we will divide this uh, Q&A session into two parts, two big parts uh, or four big parts, I'm not sure. Let's see, uh, I will follow what uh, uh, Mas Putra or Yahya present. Uh, for the questions that presented here on the slides. So uh, let's continue. Uh, the first question is for uh, Dr. Elske van der Vliert uh, from Nugroho Hassan from UNS, uh, Universitas Negeri 11 Maret uh, in Surakarta. Uh, in Indonesia, extension workers usually didn't hold any licenses for their competency regarding the situation, how to improve agricultural extension system in local area or village. Also, is it better if we use the local extension worker? Uh, Professor Elska, uh, would you please to answer? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there were a lot of questions actually that I think relate okay. around the same theme. So if you allow me, I will address a couple of them at the same time. Oh yes, that's wonderful. Thank you very <laughs> yeah, because, much. Because uh, I think it's it's all part of the of of the way how the needs of farmers and the 
and the current extension system are still mismatched. You know, of course, the, the serve their extension officers try really hard. You know, most of the time, and they they work, but they are limited. As I said earlier, you know, they come from a certain background. They only have limited resources, and the incentive system doesn't really support them to do their job in a professional way. So, so that is the problem. So we have to start with education and training and. Uh, and we see that, of course, the official, um, um, like government officials or extension officers, they often have either university degree or diploma uh, from the agriculture schools. But now we also use a lot of the community extension officers who might be farmers, who probably may have a lot more knowledge, local, locally applicable knowledge, but not always the skills to further enhance that or the access. So it is, and that's why I said that transformation is needed. You know, you cannot just um, stop gap, you know, what, what we say, you, you know, you can't just, you know, improve a little bit here and there. It is about, the, you have to start with the education. And I think, you know, university that does, that does teach agriculture extension, you have to think about what are you teaching people, you know? Um, are people starting from a technical background and then they learn the skills, how to further develop that together with farmers? Or do you have extension experts who are good at facilitating, for instance, co-innovation and co-learning, but may not have as much technical knowledge? So, so there's, there's something to say for both. And, and, and probably, I mean, I came from a, a science background, got into communication, and I know how important it is to have both, but how do we, how do we work with that? So, so that is something that education system needs to first think about and work. My experience is, for me, the most the most valuable extension officers, or what we often call field researchers, who help facilitate these co innovation processes, are those who actually have have very good people skills, you know, and facilitation skills and critical skills, who can help farmers to develop those critical skills as well. And I think that is that is probably the most important part because nowadays information is is generally available. And it was just a question also from, um, um, uh, uh, it relates to APRI's and also Adi's question in the end, you know, that where do you need to start, you know, um, with that mismatch, mismatch, you know, the farmer's needs and the and ability. Of course, we need to start from farmer's needs and abilities and them not being educated, meaning they cannot learn or they cannot improve. I've worked with a lot of illiterate farmers who became very effective you know, in Eastern Indonesia, Timor Leste, we can very effective uh, business managers, you know, because they, they do have those skills. Where I think it needs to start in, in terms of farmers, and therefore that influences the way what their facilitators, whether it's agriculture extension officers or NGO staff or private sector staff, it needs to start from what we usually call conscientization, is a, a term from the Adult, adult education kind of theories, Paulo Freire, it is like raising critical awareness that you are in a situation that you can improve. It is not about somebody telling you or national targets demanding you to change. It is about you knowing that you actually don't have to go hungry or you don't have to um, you know, face a loss or you don't have to do things that other people say, that you, that you see opportunities for yourself to improve. And, and we've done that in various programs by doing the participatory situa situation analysis first, where both farmers and other people in the community and researchers and extension officers work together in analyzing that situation. And it's not about the ones with higher education telling them what the problem is, it's them discovering and actually seeing then and weighing which are the best options that they then want to try out together. So, so it's a very different way. For that, you need really people who can facilitate that process. And that's something that you cannot learn in a two-day, you know, quick training somewhere, you know, fly off to Jakarta, you do it. No, you have to learn that by doing and being mentored into doing that. And that then relates, of course, with the incentive system, you know, with both the institutional system and the incentive system. As, as uh, who said that, there was one of you who said, well, the problem is that um, the extension officers um, you know, they, they don't, they, uh, they don't, they have difficulties doing their job. Yeah, partly because the incentive system doesn't allow them to do it properly. You know, they, but it was, I think it was Fadila who said, you know, both the, the farmers uh, who 
uh, pharma groups are not effective. And it's partly because, you know, they only reward it for being an advanced pharma group when they take off all the administrative things. They have like 12 books or something, they, including the visitor's book and whatever, you know, that they have to keep records of to show their good pharma group. Whereas, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you keep your visitor's list, you know, to be a good farmer and improve. As, and the same for extension officers, they get rewarded for sitting in a training rather than going out to the field and making sure that farmers develop critical skills. And so that all needs to kind of be rethought and, and changed from the bottom, you know, from the very basic starts of how do you recruit people, what capacities do you need, how do you further develop those capacities and the farmer groups as well. So, yeah, so um, I think that that kind of and that's why I said, you know, you can you cannot stop get that. So, and I think it, it links a little bit with um, with what Sabrina said about, you know, that it that it's that it's you know mismatch between the 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 setting of the targets and, and what the, you know, from above and what the farmers do. Yes, <laughs> if we are serious about that, sustainable change can only happen through empowerments. You know, we will not be able to to do that by setting national targets and telling them to telling farmers to. To, to commit to that because a friend, she gave that example of, of um, um, soybean production. So yeah, farmers are told to, uh, to produce soybeans, but they know the price is low. Well, if the price is low, then it's a high supply, low demand. So why, you know, so why would you then the national target be producing more and, and actually go against the market mechanism? So then I think, therefore I said that change has to happen at all levels, including at the national level. And if I know exactly how to do that, I'd probably be Minister of Agriculture, but I'm not. So I'm sure there's a lot of other things that need to be considered. So I think I covered you know, quite a few of the questions um, mm. of various people. Yeah. That's wonderful. So several so keywords, uh, education is one of the key and institutional development actually, like from the bottom to the, not only top down, but also bottom up, something like that. Institutional That's change. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, something like that. All right, thank you uh, for the answer. Uh, let's uh, move to questions to Professor Nasir. This is from Burara from uh, UGM. Uh, Cameron Highlands is well known for its intensively occupation by vegetables greenhouses in Malaysia, both for domestic and import consumption, for example, uh, Singapore. Uh, what can be shared as the best practices on how Malaysian government can develop this area as its food supply center, but also well cope with the sustainability issues, uh, such as indigenous uh, rights, indigenous rights, uh, land protection. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arini. Uh, Cameron Highland basically is the uh, largest producing highland vegetables in, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, of course, as but, uh, rightly point out, pointed out, this is for local consumption and also for export. First, uh, probably there is a different, I would say, land policy in different countries. I'm not sure how the land policy in Indonesia, but in Malaysia, the land policy basically is state matters. You see, Malaysia consisting of various states. I think Indonesia consisting of various provinces. Eh? So, so, but this Cameron Highland is used to be vacant land in the forest area, highland forest. Yeah? So, of course, the land belongs to the government. But then, of course, there are indigenous people there. Yeah? So, the thing is that when they open up the land, is how the coexistence between investors and also employment opportunities. Uh, this is how to, yeah? So, meaning that investor from outside invest open up the land of course you now a lot of uh, greenhouses and everything modern farming smart farming and everything over there but then in the process of open up new land in the process of investment the local basically indigenous people there they will seek the employment opportunities from the opening up new land so this coexistence somehow make a win-win situation. And of course, indigenous people also have the right to the land. So meaning that the government also give them incentives, subsidies, for them to participate in the vegetable production. So meaning that investor from outside, the indigenous people together, 
uh, as employment opportunities and also an investment. And that's number one. Of course, there are there are problem of environmental issues and so forth. Eh? Number two, the policies has been as far as in Cameron Highland. Uh, in economics, we call that social optimality <laughs> versus private optimality. Uh, the policies has been try to, I think, I think there's no professor, professor Wessler, I think they mentioned about how can we incorporate uh, the private optimality into social optimality. So meaning that a lot of policies, a lot of incentive given to that area so that so that a lot of input use in terms of land in terms of capital in terms of other other um, variable variable cost like fertilizer everything so they try to push in terms of how the decision making must incorporate the social development must incorporate the environmental issues, must incorporate the economics, uh, economics uh, for, for the people over there. So with all these three uh, together, that's why there are not, there are a lot of issues of, I would say environment, of course there are a lot of issues, but that is not my issue of indigenous people, things like that. Because as I said just now, together, investor and also the people, indigenous people over there, uh, together investing in, in, in palm land, uh, vegetable production, and also together in terms of employment opportunities. That's number one. So because of this, I think uh, we have, I would say, uh, sustainable, uh, if not 100% sustainable, but sustainable in the sense that we do take care in terms of environment, although there are a bit of environmental issue, uh, we do take care in terms of the people over there, in terms of economic, yeah, economic development, and also in terms of social development. So I think a lot of studies also has been conducted there. Eh? I also have conducted one study in terms of cabbage production, in terms of their sustainability. I think uh, from zero to 100, I think I remember it's about close to 80 in terms of the index of sustainability. But in developing the index, we do take, uh, we did take into consideration the element of sustainability. And that's my response. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's uh, wonderful. Thank you for the answer. So basically, good partnership is the key, uh, which uh, result to social optimum besides the economic optimum, and the two, the, the socio-economic optimum, uh, creating the environmental awareness and yeah. preservation uh, as the attitude for the local farmers. Okay, uh, let's continue to the third questions to uh, Dr. Jangkung Handoyo Mulyo. These questions come from uh, Ibu Haryani from UGM. And food diversification has been programmed for a long time. How much influence does food diversification have in reducing food insecurity? What policies need to be implemented so that the food diversification program can be more effective? Uh, Dr. Jangkung, would you please uh, your answer? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Arini, uh, very nice question, especially about uh, uh, local food diversification. As we have already known that uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, local food diversification, it is not easy because it's related to human behavior, especially in uh, uh, food consumption. So we need a long time to change the behavior of people in consuming food. Therefore, uh, we have to do uh, many uh, uh, efforts. In my opinion, uh, one thing that should we do is uh, uh, there must be a cooperation between uh, several ministries, especially Ministry uh, of uh, Agricultural Affairs, Ministry uh, of uh, uh, National Education and Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs. Those have made a cooperation. What I mean here is that uh, changing a food pattern will be more effective if it is initiated or started uh, when uh, people still in uh, very young. 
let's say in uh, preschool, preschool uh, education, uh, or in elementary education, they have to uh, give what we call like a, a curriculum that, uh, uh, for instance, every day, every day, um, a student, um, student has to bring a local food. Maybe it will be a big burden for the parent of the student for the first stage. However, if this program doing uh, continuously, then uh, sooner or later, they will understand, the student will understand that uh, we need a, a local food uh, diversification and it is a part of their um, uh, uh, daily habits. Therefore, uh, in the near future, food, uh, local food diversification will be, uh, will be uh, an effective policy. If we do not uh, take into account uh, Ministry of Education, especially at the uh, preschool and elementary school, then um, I do not believe that this program will be success in the near future because changing uh, food behavior is very difficult and, and it is not an easy way. Therefore, uh, if the government have uh, what we call, uh, effort to do that one, hopefully that a local food diversification will be success. And we hope that we can uh, change our uh, food consumption from only uh, rice or patty to become local food uh, that already uh, uh, available in every area of Indonesia. We have a lot of local food and we have to do that one if we are going to be a, a sovereign day, uh, uh, country. Thank you very much. Thank you for the answer, Dr. Jangkung. So basically uh, the key is to start at the very a young age, a preschool age. Okay, so uh, the last questions for session one. We will have uh, another three session, I believe. To Professor Wesseler, this is from Professor Dwi Jono uh, from UGM. Do you consider or do you mean that the social tolerable is the same as the social willingness to accept? Uh, I think this infer refer to your graph. One of yes, uh, thanks, very important question. Um, not necessarily. So this uh, threshold level, this I star, as I uh, mentioned, is um, uh, a threshold level where we would look for uh, indications whether or not this would be met. Looking at um, social willingness to accept can be one of the uh, ways of doing this. Uh, one has to bear in mind that uh, if we talk about uh, new developments in producing food, uh, uh, producing bioeconomy uh, products that uh, consumer sovereignty also plays a very important role. So some consumers may not like the product, others may, uh, may like it. And then it basically is up to the market whether or not a new product uh, will make it uh, there. And just because some consumers do not like a product should not necessarily be a reason for not introducing a product uh, into a market. So that puts some limits on uh, uh, the uh, willingness to accept at a societal level. All right, thank you very much for the, uh, the brief answer. So let's continue to the session two of the discussion. I'm sorry. I really apologize for the back sound. Uh, so session two, uh, the first question is to Professor Nasir from uh, Bu Asih at UGM. Regarding food waste, could you explain how Malaysia solves the problem of uh, food waste, especially in this pandemic? Uh, is there any specific policy to fix the problem? Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have, we don't really have any policy on food waste. Um, but uh, we have, uh, I would say, action or strategy on how we uh, try to minimize the food waste. 
So basically, our strategy is recently we incorporate in the primary school and our secondary school in terms of environmental education. So this includes the food waste. Eh? Um, and also, we promote a lot in terms of sustainable consumption. Eh? Since, I mean, we have been talking a lot of sustainable production but in terms of sustainable consumption. So to answer your question, yes, we have few strategies. We have few promotion, but as of now, we don't have any policy on how to reduce the food waste. Eh? Of course, uh, um, based on our religion, of course, eh? it's, it's of course that you know, uh, food waste is something which is not very, very good. <laughs> and so this is the thing that we try to complain. Because we believe that anything to change the habit is from the primary school, eh? from the children education. That's why we incorporate in the primary school. Not in secondary, in fact, start from the primary school. So that is my, my response in terms of fitness. Right, thank you. And then there is one other question to Professor Nasir from Pak Gilang at UGM. What is the best way to evaluate the balance uh, of the balance between food environment and economics? And the second question is, we face two contradictions in the same time, hunger and obesity. What do you think is the main factor that uh, contribute to those issues? To answer for question number one, I remember when I had my first course in environmental economics, they have one this theory called Kuznets curve. <laughs> for those have economic courses, I think they have taken that course. Meaning that as our income increase, the demand for environmental quality also increases. Uh, so there is a positive correlation between the demand for environmental quality and also in terms of uh, capital uh, income. Yeah? So being having said that, why basically high income countries can I would say their environmental, their sustainability levels is much better than developing countries is that initially, basically in, in developing countries, when we in, want to improve our economic growth, we tend to use inputs which are not sustainable. Uh -huh. that, that, that's normally initially, uh -huh. so that we can, you know, we use a lot of in agriculture, we use a lot of pesticide, we use a lot of inorganic fertilizer, all those. Why? Because we want to improve the productivity. But as our food capital increase, the demand for food quality, the demand for food safety is becoming more and more significant. So this basically gave a trigger, a message to the producer that they should produce their vegetable, their food production in sustainability manner. Yeah? So, 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 so what I'm saying is that in order to um, balance the three, such uh, environment, economic growth, and also social element, then of course, the policy is one thing, but the knowledge, perception, attitude of the community should be there. Yeah? So I said just now, of course, in ASEAN countries, uh, including Malaysia and Indonesia, as I said, as our per capita increase, the demand for food quality is becoming more and more. And this will give message to producer to produce sustainability. Yeah? So of course, this is how they want to produce sustainability. As I said just now in my the, uh, previous, uh, previous response is that in economics, how can we uh, internalize the externalities? the negative externalities in the food production. So this is where we are giving more and more incentive for social optimality, meaning that marginal social cost equal to marginal social profit. And it is a marginal social return, this economic. Uh, we service marginal private cost versus marginal uh, private uh, return. Eh? So, this is, so to move that, of course, incentive must be given to the producer so that they will not lose their, 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 their income. Their return. So this is very important. For the second question, hunger and obesity. Well, I'm not really in a medical background, but I think obesity, nothing to do with hunger. Obesity is when you don't eat right food, basically. 
the food that you consume is not in the right manner, not in the right diet. That's why we have obesity. Eh? So I'm not really know how to how to answer that question. But what, what I say is that hunger is one thing, but obesity is people who have money probably, but they don't consume right diet. So that they have obesity. So this is basically my response. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay, thank you for the answer. Let's continue to the next question. Uh, the next one is uh, to Dr. Jangkung from uh, Anisa Wijarani at UGM. Indonesian government have conduct import to maintain food availability and avoid food insecurity. However, farmers thought that import can be disadvantageous for them due to the lower price they receive uh, because of the uh, excess supply and low absorption, low absorption of the crop, crop production in the market. Would you please give opinions related to, the, related to this situation and what is the most effective method for balancing both needs, uh, I think, like supply and the farmer's welfare in this case? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari. Uh, uh, Ms. Anissa Wijarani. With Jarani, thank you very much for your uh, good uh, question. Yes, uh, I suppose for most of Indonesia, especially who work in university, we know that almost every year there is a debate in terms of food policy, especially uh, do we really need uh, import of rice or not? Yeah, And this issue uh, always uh, what do we call repeat uh, every year because some uh, part say that okay we have enough food we do not need to uh, import and then other uh, uh, party they say that no we have to import otherwise otherwise then uh, 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 influence of food availability of the people in my uh, humble opinion I say that first, uh, we need uh, uh, coordination among uh, ministries. Yeah. Coordination is very important. Of course, maybe they have already done that one. But the second one, coordination is of ministry. Please sit down and bring single and valid data. Bring single and valid data. The second one is very difficult. If if all ministry of if all if all party who have responsibility in making a decision whether we need import or not, having single and valid data, then it is not difficult to make a decision about we need to import or not. I'm not sure that uh, those, um, uh, those uh, stakeholders who come and make decision, they bring single and valid data. Therefore, our challenge is that we need um, uh, what we call national management of uh, uh, agricultural data, especially for uh, food production. Because uh, this is uh, the source of issues that already discussed every year. There are many uh, journalists uh, always asking us, how about your opinion? Do we really need a uh, report of rice or not? So that is, uh, in my opinion, that we need to do. So having a uh, management of national data, that is uh, single data and file data. So whoever the minister, uh, every ministerial, Every ministry, they have to use those data. Then it is not difficult to make a decision. That is uh, my uh, opinion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And then I think this will be questions. The next one for Professor Wesseler. Uh, from uh, Dr. Ilmas uh, at UGM. To start the bioeconomy, uh, project, it seems that it needs a huge in, in, investments. 
Hence, uh, only large farms or big firms may be able to run this project. In your perspective, how the involvement of small-scale farming may be presented? Do you think without support from the government through regulation, this project could still be implemented since some regions are still debatable to run the project? Meanwhile, private sectors are interested. Moreover, how is the impact of perceived costs if certain regions were delayed in approval of the technology? Okay, this is technical. So please, Professor Wessler. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Um, important question. This is an issue that always comes forward in the debates of uh, uh, development, not only related to the bioeconomy. Now, first of all, this not necessarily has to exclude small farmers. There are a huge amount of examples where small farmers have benefits uh, from new developments in the bioeconomy. Um, so we have to consider that the bioeconomy includes the agricultural sector. And think, for example, about uh, uh, BT egg plants being introduced in, in Bangladesh, which are uh, rapidly adapted among smallholder farmers there. Um, think about uh, BT cotton in uh, India. We have other examples, uh, cowpea uh, resistant varieties in Nigeria. Um, so there, uh, that is where small farmers can benefit. Now there is uh, another issue, uh, and that is related: how quickly can you get access? And that is where governments can play a very important role. They have a role in assessing the safety of these new technologies, and uh, the, uh, we know from our studies that uh, how you assess this safety can be very time-consuming and lengthy, or short and and rapid without compromising on the safety issues. It's more like how you design the safety assessments. And there seem to be substantial uh, differences in timing. And um, this relates into the other question that has been raised. Yes, countries lose if they have an pr approval system uh, that takes more time in comparison to the approval system in other regions. So companies may choose or those uh, private sector uh, institutions that develop these new technologies, uh, those regions uh, where it will be less costly uh, to get the approval. Just to give you one example, we have a project um, funded by the European Union on a tobacco variety that is high in cyanophythin. Cyanophythin is an important biopolymer that you can use for extracting amino acids. And this is something, uh, uh, cyanophycin, uh, biological produced cyanophycin, basically is a substitute for cyanophycin extraction from fossil fuels. Now, uh, this tobacco variety of, offers an opportunity for tobacco farmers. You know that uh, tobacco uh, production is coming a lot under pressure because of uh, uh, the issues related to consuming nicotine for, for uh, good reasons. You have, it, it would be nice if those farmers who have a lot of experience and knowledge of cultivating tobacco, if they have an opportunity to continue to use this knowledge, but for something that is more useful and beneficial. Now, this tobacco variety is uh, derived from a transgenic tobacco. The, uh, within this project, we do the cultivation in Argentina as field trials in the European Union are so expensive to test these varieties that it's basically not uh, uh, cannot be financed. While in Argentina, the safety requirements for implementing the field trials are less expensive. So you go there and, and, and do these kind of uh, uh, tests. And these tobacco varieties, if they would be approved, then can help uh, small scale as well as large scale uh, tobacco producers. Now, a, th a second issue, many of these developments are happening at, at small scale farmer. The processing, that is where you often need uh, uh, higher investments. It's the same like in the rice sector, if you have a rice mill, you have a, you need a, a higher amount of investments and uh, rightly so. But as we see, for example, for the case of rice or for oil palm, et cetera, this is what the private sector can handle. And you leave, we have to leave this responsibility to the private sector. The government should not get too much involved in there. They should not take up the risk 
of the private sector. We should not socialize these risks. They still need to be within the private sector. Thank you very much for the uh, answer, Professor Wesseler. So uh, actually, we are uh, a little bit uh, running late in time. So, but I was told that there will be another two questions: one for Professor Elska, one for Dr. Jankum. Yes. So, a uh, question to Professor Elska from Mitra Musika Lubis from UMA. How to motivate agriculture students to research in the village where they live because they thought that returning to the village was shameful. Uh, so there is a stigma around agriculture uh, in Indonesia. How can we proceed the adoption of technology if the youth are not interested? This is related to the low interest of the youth in agriculture. Yes. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, uh, I once did a presentation uh, for the GFRES uh, forum, which is the, the global facility on, uh, on uh, rural advisory services, um, uh, about this. And actually, the title was How to Make Agriculture Sexy Again. It's basically how to get, <laughs> how to get young people involved uh, so that they are attracted. And the question, of course, is whether you're talking about getting uh, young people, you know, who are who go for education in the city, whether it's bachelor's degree, diploma, whether you want them to go back into agriculture production or be in the service sector, you know, like an extension officer or in a private sector. So that's two different things. Um, uh, you you talk here about research, I think specifically, and how can you get people to go back to research again? I think it needs to start in in how we again it has to start from our basic education and our, our general kind of communication. What kind of value do we put on our food and on our uh, and on the ones who produce our food you know so I think that that has to be ingrained in in, in people particularly in students about that if you if you go to a, a well esteemed university like UGM and study agriculture and all they offer is kind of fancy about fancy equipment and modeling and this that and the other thing and actually not uh, it, it doesn't link with the realities of your own village, where if you come from wherever, of the Eastern Islands or wherever, you know, where the situation is not possible to, then there's something wrong with the education as well. You know, so we, and that's why, that's why I said earlier, education is about looking at that whole spectrum of things where you can contribute as a researcher or as a, an educator. And, and it has to be, you know, you have to look at the possibilities between you know what uh, technologies and modeling or, or models or whatever and the realities and and I've, i strongly believe that uh, change can happen at any level but you have to start from the level where where the people are and and i remember and that, that actually links to a question somebody else had about a concrete example i remember we we were working in uh, in uh, in um and the uh, province uh, uh, around kupang it was about it initially, it was it was actually about enhancing uh, cattle production, but it became really about enhancing, you know, the whole farming system uh, because it had to be integrated corn, cattle, you know, because it's the, the only things that farmers had had access to. Um, but but the main thing was that that farmers needed to see that they could they could actually uh, uh, move up. So so it, 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 it was partly the researchers who had the issue that they needed to push their technologies, you know, and that they had their targets, you know, even though they were into participatory approaches, but in the end when farmers did, they had learned what to do, what was useful for them, which was actually using their corn excess production, sell that to the market and use that money to buy, the, the plan was to buy cattle so they could have their own cattle again and actually make a lot more income. And some decided to actually buy a rice thresher and start doing some biz business. Another decided to, you know, to buy pigs because it's easier to to grow pigs in the in the in the Timorese context and sell them to have some quick income rather than than cattle that uh, that takes two years or, or longer before you can sell. And so, research is very disappointed. But then actually, we had to make them see. No, it's about it, it, our target is not get more cattle. Our target is about improvement of farmers' ability to enhance their own livelihood. So, and I think when young people see that, that actually they can get into that business or they can get into supporting exciting things that have impact on the ground. And we talk about that when we educate them, you know, that it is a major challenge that we all have to work on because we all have to work towards sustainable development goals. 
then it is going to be, it should be attractive. You know? uh, unfortunately, what we still see is that a lot of the people who are well-educated and motivated and do well in the field, they get hired by the private companies who pay much high salaries. So again, <laughs> we have to go back to the institutional change. How can it also be not only motivated in a motivational level, but also at a you know incentive and financial level be attractive for people? So that's why we need to look at all those little bits of the you know of change in the system. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's wonderful. Institutional, institutional change again. Uh, related Again, to no. brain drain. Yeah, brain drain is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, and then the last question is actually for Dr. Jangkung. So there was a written previously to Professor uh, Elske, but uh, I was informed by the committee that uh, the time is limited. So this will be the last question to Dr. Jangkung from Zulfi Primasani, but uh, he or she didn't mention uh, the institution, the affiliation. Uh, what kind of policy should the government do to encourage young people to become farmers, given the very complex constraints in rural areas, such as limited land, limited capital, uh, markets, uh, access, and other public facilities that greatly affect the interest of young people to become farmers? So this is actually related with previous questions. Please, Dr. Jangkung. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arini. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Su. Mr. Zulfi or Ms. Zulfi? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, how to uh, prepare for uh, farmer regeneration, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. in my opinion, uh, there are many, uh, uh, there are many activities that we have done uh, to uh, uh, prepare uh, farmer regeneration. First, uh, we need to grow uh, young entrepreneurs. Uh, in this case, we have a good example, for instance, Ministry, uh, Ministry of Agriculture have already uh, make a collaboration with, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, more than uh, 10 uh, state university to, uh, to what we call, to, uh, to facilitate to young uh, entrepreneur to be, uh, to run their business. Yeah, actually uh, uh, the ministry, or uh, uh, provide uh, grantee, provide seed money, and then a uh, student who interested in uh, entrepreneur, they have to make a, a business plan, and then uh, there and then uh, the business plan uh, uh, evaluated by the committee. Those who win uh, uh, will get uh, seed money. Then uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, with the university, they always uh, monitor and evaluate about the progress of uh, 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 this uh, business plan. And the other program that can be uh, that can be uh, done by uh, the government is uh, we need to uh, strengthening uh, our vocational uh, uh, education. What I mean here is that uh, uh, we have to. Uh, more focus on uh, vocational education in agriculture uh, need to uh, give uh, um, give uh, subject not only focus on agriculture extension but we need to uh, add with a business aspect therefore uh, a student who study in the vocational education they got to think First about a technical term, technical aspect, and then the other one about uh, running a business. Therefore, uh, we hope that by doing that one, we will produce uh, 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 young entrepreneurs, especially those uh, who uh, who have willingness to be entrepreneur in uh, in agri business. And the other one, uh, also government already done. Uh, uh, they have what we call program like internship for young farmers. To, to be trained not only in uh, in in uh, Jakarta or in Indonesia, but uh, the government sent sent several uh, young farmers to uh, get internship, for instance, uh, to Japan. Therefore, they got uh, information and skill there, and then after that, they return home to Indonesia, and then they can uh, start for running a business. Hopefully, that uh, this program. Still, uh, 
uh, still run up until now. And we hope that this program will be intensified in order to what we call to involve as much as possible the participant. And the last thing that I can say is that we really need a national movement. National movement. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, we uh, we need national movement. Uh, to be proud as young uh, entrepreneurs, especially in activities. So uh, nowadays, all, also the Ministry of Agriculture uh, have a competition. Then they select uh, what they call uh, qualified uh, young entrepreneur to become ambassador agriculture. Ambassador agriculture will uh, doing their uh, their their business, especially in agri business. And also, they uh, inform many things. They, 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 what we call, they say to uh, people that to become an uh, entrepreneur in agribusiness is, uh, uh, what we call, is, uh, is a proud for, for them. Therefore, we hope that uh, there, there are many uh, people that are uh, interested in uh, getting uh, uh, agribusiness for their uh, livelihood. I think that is uh, that we can uh, uh, we can do uh, in order to prepare uh, farmer regeneration. Thank you very much. Time to Dr. Arini. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Jangkung. And that marks the end of invited speaker session. We thank you very much for all uh, active participation for the participants. Uh, it seems that many of you are really shy to uh, asking your questions uh, and we are really sorry that uh, there are many questions that are not answered uh, in this occasion. Uh, and on behalf of the Department of Agriculture and Socioeconomics, I would like to extend a sincere gratitude to uh, Professor Elske van der Vliert, uh, Professor uh, Nasir Samshuddin, Dr. Jangkung Handoyo Mulyo, and Professor Justus Wesseler for the remarkable knowledge sharing. And we also apologize uh, for any mistakes and shortcomings uh, in facilitating these sessions. Uh, and we wish you all a pleasant rest of the day. And I would like to hand it back to uh, the MC, Ms. Dian. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be there. Thank, Thank you very much, much Bu Arini. And we will have a photo session with the invited speaker together with the moderator. Um, we hope that all invited speakers could turn on your camera. Right? Uh, are we ready? Allow me to count in three, two, one. Smile. Again. Three, two, one. Smile. Once more. In three, two, one. Smile. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking your time with us today. And yeah, ladies and gentlemen, as we have finished our keynote speech and plenary session this morning and so afternoon, coming up to the last session, which is the parallel or paper presentation sessions. And we should inform you that this par parallel session is also open for public. So for those who wish to join this parallel session, we would like to inform you that the event will be starting at 12 45 um, Indonesian time or Jakarta time. So practically we'll have 30 minutes to have a short break. And also you can proceed the dedicated room. Zoom meeting at this uh, on screen. You may look on your screen in the ujm.id slash XSR2. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to say thank you very much for your participation. Um, from this morning up to this afternoon. We will meet again in the parallel session. Thank you. Thank See you. you in 30 minutes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Prof. See you. Prof. Elske, Prof. Nasir. Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Elske. Thank you, Prof. Nasir. Prof. Thanks Nasir. very much. Terima kasih, Pak Jangkung. Yeah. Thank you very much. See you soon in Jogja, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Insya Allah, Prof.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You should come to GM. Uh-huh. Right. I will. I will. Come back to Maria Boro. <laughs> Maria Boro. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. 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 Thank